Dr. Hicks, who we have with us today, is a Canadian-American philosopher and intellectual historian who teaches at Rockwood University, Illinois, where he also directs the Center of Ethics and Entrepreneurship. He is the author of four books ranging from topics on logical analysis to Nietzsche to postmodernism, which is the topic for today. His foundational understanding of the philosophy and its origins and implications have influenced not only the work of Jordan Peterson, a former guest of the Mill series, but even helped me constitute a thorough, lucid, and robust understanding of postmodernism, especially through his many recorded online lectures. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor, thought leader, and intellectual powerhouse to the Mill series of Lafayette. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Hayes. Thanks a lot, Saeed. On September 13th, 2018, Stephen Hicks visited Lafayette to deliver a presentation entitled Postmodernism, Politics and Philosophy. Hicks stayed for roughly four hours giving a lecture, then participating in a long Q&A and post-Q&A conversation. Over the course of this four hours, we covered five main questions. First, what is postmodernism? Or more precisely, what are the key tenets of postmodernist thinking? Second, and most centrally for Hicks, what accounts for the rise of postmodernism in the second half of the 20th century? Third, how and to what extent has the rise of postmodernism affected our society? Fourth, psychologically, what drives contemporary postmodernists and those over whom they have influence? Fifth and finally, since postmodernism is a critique of the Enlightenment, we ask, what factors account for the emergence of the Enlightenment in Western Europe centuries ago? The video is organized into five sections corresponding to these questions. In some sections, I will combine material from Hicks' presentation and the post-presentation Q&A and conversation. We spend about an hour on the first question, a little over an hour on the second, a little over half an hour on the third, roughly 15 minutes on the fourth, and over half an hour on the fifth. In the description box, I've listed and stamped the starting times for each of these sections. Let's begin with the first question. What are the main tenets of postmodernist thinking? Most broadly, postmodernists reject modernism, where modernism is roughly synonymous with the Enlightenment. So to answer the what is postmodernism question, you have to understand what the Enlightenment is. It's the Enlightenment project that the postmoderns see themselves as being against. So what is the Enlightenment project? And it's big. <laughs> What do we mean when we say the entire right, modern world and all of the institutions? Well, right, science, religion, economics, politics, industrial revolution, relationships between the sexes, uh, battles over the elimination of slavery, et cetera, et cetera. That's the whole shebang. The modern world has been revolutionary in at least eight or nine major cultural dimensions. But this is my way of putting it together. If you go back to some of the people we mentioned a little earlier, Francis Bacon, uh, Rene Descartes and uh, John Locke, you'll notice all of them are in the 1600s. And that's a candidate. Argument between Bacon and Descartes or their followers over who should properly be the founding fathers, and I think you could probably make a case that they're co-fathers. Both of them disagree with each other about how reason should work. Right? Bacon is much more empiricist. Locke is what we call a rationalist, but both of them are committed to the idea that reason is fundamental against earlier, more authoritarian forms of epistemology. Locke, a couple of generations, a mature, more mature, uh, working out of the empiricist project. But what we have by the time we get to John Locke, who is also of the generation of Isaac Newton, they are contemporaries, is Empiricism and reason are working together, and that's the fundamental epistemology. And this is revolutionary, because once you're no longer intellectually authoritarian, that you believe in certain texts as containing the absolute truth, or that you believe in certain institutions as infallibly delivering the truth to you, that we have to think for ourselves and do the hard empirical and analytical work, you're in a different philosophical universe. Now, part of this is fairly straightforward. If we then say our empirical understanding of the world is fundamental, that gives birth to science. And what we then see is as that epistemology takes off, science becomes mature. After Galileo, right, we get impressive developments in mathematics. Uh, Leibniz and Newton are famous here. We get this 
astoundingly mature work from Isaac Newton published in the 1680s that then really is a make work project for physical scientists for the next two centuries right, until, uh, until Newton comes along. So what we recognize as mature physical science comes into existence in the latter part of the 1600s. And then we can see chemistry coming on board and its founding uh, maturity is in the 1700s. Biology getting its foot and coming on board by the time we get seriously into the 1800s and so on. Uh, if you take the very hard project and start to apply scientific understanding to human beings, right, you get medicine and getting rid of uh, apologies to old wives, getting rid of all of the old wives tales, getting rid of the, the, uh, the idea that sins are, sorry, diseases are punishments for various sins, uh, or that we need to pray and sacrifice chickens and, right, uh, uh, and find witch doctors of various sorts in order to solve various problems. We get all of that out of our system and we have modern empirical rational medicine and that comes in, but human beings are complicated a little bit later. But now we are very seriously into the end of the 1700s and recognizably we have the modern sciences in place and we have their application to, to modern medicine. If we're not so interested directly in human beings but we take all of the theoretical science and we're being empirical about working with our hands and what can we do with our stuff, we have a boom in inventiveness and amateur and then increasingly professional engineers and the integration of the theoretical science and the practical tinkering and systematic uh, uh, inventing work, the Industrial Revolution takes off and the dates again are not accidental here. Uh, 1750 is typically when most historians will say the Industrial Revolution very clearly is going on. James Watt, 1769, the first commercially feasible steam engine the one that uh, delivers commercially more energy output than it costs for the, uh, for the energy input. And then our ability to control the natural world and manufacture things for the good of everybody, more stuff, better quality, lower prices, and so on. Uh, as a result of that, right, we start to see life expectancy going up. That's the health indicator here. I don't know if you know these numbers, but for basically the last 17,000 years of human history, life expectancy was in the 30s, right, everywhere. Before metallurgy and agricultural revolution, it was apparently in the 20s. What happened starting in 1700s in the nations most governed by the Enlightenment? At this point, it's the Northwestern European nations for the most part. Life expectancy starts to go up and go up dramatically. Over the course of a, the next century, it doubles. Never has ha happened before in human history, a doubling of life expectancy, but it's precisely in these nations right, that it happens, where this intellectual revolution has taken hold. So we got more stuff and we're living longer, but what happens if we turn to the normative disciplines? Now we're taking reason seriously, that individuals need to think for themselves. Well, the individual then becomes very important. You are not Right, under intellectual authorities. You need to think for yourself and your freedom to be able to think for yourself and then increasingly to act on the basis of your individual judgment starts to become very important. And so we start to see much more individualistic thinking, particularly since the big battles had been over religious doctrine and much of Europe is going through its religious wars. At a certain point we say, look, you're not going to convert anybody's mind by torturing and killing them to death and threatening to wipe out their entire families for believing the wrong things. What we need to do is adopt a live and let live policy as a practical matter. But really, the only way anybody is going to save their soul or figure out the truth is if they get there on their own. And that requires social tolerance. We have to respect individuality in religious matters and then increasingly in all of the other matters. Now, liberalism, very broadly speaking, is just individualism applied to political matters. You're not born into a class. You should not be a slave. You should not be a second-class citizen. Right? The doctrine of the universal liberty rights of all individuals, we start to see that language and rhetoric and sophisticated arguments for increasingly late 1600s on into the early 1700s. Uh, and again, it's in the nations that are most committed initially to this broadly enlightenment project. 
if we say people are rational and people are individuals, then the economic consequences seem to be pretty obvious as well. Well, we should leave people responsible for their own economic lives. Let people choose whatever it is that they want to make. Don't require them to get licenses and permissions from their feudal lords and their kings. Or say that because you're born in this class, here's the limited range of occupations that you can go into, and you shouldn't aspire to go here or here. You can do whatever you want. Right? Uh, find your dream and pursue that and make a living however it is that you want. We also are going to start respecting people. Well, people are pretty smart and they can learn. They can learn to be informed consumers. We don't need to guide them by the hand and tell them what they can and can't buy and how much they should pay for it. They can judge for themselves what's good for them. They can negotiate. They can figure out what the proper prices and so on should be. And we should let people trade freely with each other. And the capstone of that is 1776, again, a very pregnant year. I think of how many amazing things happened in 1776? Well, Adam Smith writes the first modern treatise in economics, making these arguments. Now, uh, the nations that adopt capitalism increasingly become wealthier. The nations that adopt liberalism become freer. And so by the time we get into the 1800s, still a lot of work to be done. But Intellectually and culturally, there has been a revolution, and it's happened in just a couple of centuries, which is a blink of an eye in historical time. We are clearly into the modern world. And the Enlightenment thinkers are self-conscious about it. They recognize the revolution that they have wrought. And they start to use very lofty language about how freedom and the pursuit of happiness should be the natural birthrights of man, that we should not expect to suffer in misery, that we should be able to make the world better for the next generation, and so on. In principle, there's no problem that we can't figure out how to solve. And so, again, for the first time in history, this language of progress right, comes to dominate, rather than just saying, you know, there was the good old days and everything has been going downhill ever since. Or it's just the same damn thing over and over again in cycles and so on. Uh, on my reading of, uh, of history, it's not until the Enlightenment that we start to see this interpretation of history and what's possible for human beings in this very optimistic, progressive sense. And not to take it for granted because they all recognize a lot of work has to go into it, but that is what we should strive for. Now that is a one slide version of the Enlightenment project. It is a, it's a cartoon, right? but there is a place for cartoons. And it uh, abstracts away from a huge number of sub-debates that all of the Enlightenment thinkers are engaging with amongst themselves. And we are still engaged in all of those debates to our time. But the postmodern response to all of this is more radical and more fundamental. Having addressed what the Enlightenment is, we're now in a position to understand what Hicks thinks postmodernism is. Postmodernism, again, is a rejection of modernism defined as the Enlightenment. One way that postmodernists reject the Enlightenment is through epistemological skepticism or epistemological subjectivism. Leading Enlightenment figures believed that reason was potent and drove human progress. Postmodernists, by contrast, are skeptical about the efficacy of reason. They suggest that we cannot know empirical or moral truth, that bias is inescapable, that the pursuit of objectivity is futile, that all we have are our subjective preferences. Importantly, on this account, one cannot seek truth. One can only express one's subjective preferences, bond with people who share those preferences, and try to advance one's preferences, even in supposedly truth-seeking professions like journalism or academia. In other words, on the postmodern account, language is not a tool for discovering reality. It is a tool for expressing one's subjectivity and for getting what one wants, for bending the world in the direction one favors. But there is more to the defining core of postmodernism than epistemological subjectivism, according to Hicks. Postmodernists, in addition to being epistemological skeptics, tend to share a particular set of subjective biases. For one, they tend to be social constructionists, emphasizing the role that circumstances and conditioning, rather than innate tendencies, play in shaping the thoughts and actions of groups and individuals. In addition, they tend to take a negative view of the modern world. That is, they tend to believe that the Enlightenment has brought terrible real-world consequences, that we live in its dim ruins. Third, and importantly, they tend to share a collectivist left-wing outlook, viewing the social and political world as a power struggle between groups and siding with the group they regard as exploited, marginalized, dominated, etc. 
To be clear, Hicks is not arguing that epistemological subjectivism entails social constructionism and collectivist leftism. On the contrary, he argues that this collection of beliefs does not form an intellectually coherent whole. He simply argues that leading postmodernists do, in fact, tend to hold all these beliefs. There are a half a dozen postmodern thinkers who have towering stature in the discipline. Uh, many of them are European, a few of them are American, but perhaps the one who is most outstandingly recognized, and deservedly so, is Michel Foucault. And so here's a quotation from Foucault, talking about the significance of postmodernism. And he uses here a geological metaphor. Talking about Western culture as a whole, the deepest strata of Western culture have been exposed. So whatever we are doing as postmodernists, we're going down to the foundation, to the very depths of it, and are once more stirring under our feet. Could we be more precise and unpack what this metaphor is all about? What is the deepest strata, et cetera? Please advance one more. Here's Richard Rorty, probably the most famous of all of the uh, American postmodernists. And what he's arguing is, yes, when we take what's going on in Western culture, Western civilization, particularly in the modern world, we are at a transition point, but Rorty puts it more precisely. The postmodern task, that is what we're trying to do right now, postmodern thinkers like myself, is to figure out what we're supposed to be doing now that both the age of faith and the age of the Enlightenment seem beyond recovery. All right, what do we mean by the age of faith? Well, essentially we mean 1,000 years or so of Western history from fall of Rome to the Renaissance. Of course, the historians will argue about where the boundaries of that are, when what was dominant was Christian faith and orthodoxy, Christian faith in the, the Catholic tradition until there was a split with Eastern orthodoxy. But that entire pre-modern world intellectual framework right, was seen to be dysfunctional, uh, challenged by the early modern thinkers, set aside, and then we're into modernism. Modernism, the claim here is that the Enlightenment 1700s is the capstone of the modern project when all of the major ingredients have been articulated, put together into a movement, and clearly we are into a mature modernism by the time we get to the Age of Enlightenment. But Rorty's claim is now that we are a century and a half past that. We also think that that entire project has been a failure, and so essentially we are back to looking at 1,500 years ago, of, sorry, 1,500 years of Western history. Two major projects have been attempted, both are failures. What are we going to do? That's the postmodern project. Now, Foucault is French, Rorty is American. Here's a Brit, this is an international phenomenon. John Gray, another brilliant guy, has actually gone through many phases in his career, but most recently is in a postmodern phase. And he's making not only an intellectual claim, right, that the Enlightenment as an intellectual movement has failed, but we've tried to live according to Enlightenment principles. And what we see in current society is, as he describes it, the dim ruins. We are in a deeply dysfunctional, sick, corrupted society, and all of the pathologies of contemporary society are a manifestation of the death knells of the Enlightenment project. So once again, we need to set aside the entire Enlightenment project and figure out what's post to that. Well, if you remember the very first element right, on the modern Enlightenment slide was a commitment to reason, that reason works, is efficacious, and is fundamental. That on the basis of that, we can figure out the truth. It's not easy, science is hard work, but in principle we can and we have been successful at figuring out lots of truths. We know stuff. And one indication of the radicalness then of postmodernism and that they are attacking rightly at the fundamental, they know where their targets are, is this rejection of all of those fundamentally uh, 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 success concepts that we have in epistemology. And it's not just that a lot of the things that we thought we knew turned out to be wrong. It's not that the things that we thought were truths 
turned out to be wrong or that our commitment to reason is overstated. This is a strong claim that meaningless. So when I say Poitman Frimester, that's meaningless. There's no difference semantically and cognitively between saying that and true. And of course, intellectual hygiene means we should stop using these words. So on the basis of this uh, rejection, uh, this is the point at which we start to see these uh, uh, um, concepts used in quotation marks typically. Right? The postmodern writers, one rhetorical device is to put the quote, the word truth right, in quotation marks or knowledge right, in quotation marks. And that's a distancing act or flagging it for suspicion to say that we're not going to take this. And this is a very radical move to make. Now, why is this move made? Well, we'll come to that. But this is a fundamental chip. Next one, please. Now, Rorty is agreeing with Foucault. This is from an essay of his saying, this does put us in a somewhat paradoxical point because we can't be saying that truth is meaningless, but that we know that that's true. Or I know that there's no knowledge. Or the rational position after looking at everything as we do in philosophy is that rationality is meaningless. So how do we even talk as postmodernists. So the difficulty faced by a philosopher who, like myself, is sympathetic to this suggestion, Foucault's, that these concepts are philosophically meaningless, one who thinks of himself as auxiliary to the poet rather than to the physicist. Okay, that's what I want to pause there. Because this is important. Whatever it is that we are doing as philosophers and intellectuals, we should stop thinking of ourselves as working with the physicists as traditionally conceived. And if we think about the early modern project, it's precisely the achievements of the physicists, Galileo, Isaac Newton, and the others, that are seen as the paradigmatic, what we can aspire to and actually accomplish as human beings. And so philosophy and so many other intellectual disciplines try to model themselves on physics. And Rorty is then saying, well, what are the physicists trying to do? They're trying to say, well, we're trying to come to know reality and we're trying to know re uh, through, through reason and we're getting the truth and we're coming to acquire knowledge. But now we're skeptical and suspicious of all of that. So we should get rid of this uh, thinking like physics, physics talk. And we should start to see our intellectual project as closer to what poets do. And what do poets do? Well, the physicists are about being objective. That's their goal. But poets, I know I'm not necessarily subscribing to this theory of poet, but it is a mainstream view of poetry. Poets are not that concerned with objective. They're concerned with the subjective. They're concerned with uh, expressing things that they feel and believe deeply. And when we read a poem, our primary concern, and maybe not even our concern or not, is, is this poem objectively true? Has it been run through empirical and statistical tests? And where are the regressions? Right. Does completely inappropriate language. What we are interested in, again, from this perspective is, does this resonate with me right, subjectively? And it's perfectly fine, we say, when we're talking about poets, if you don't like a poem and you just want to completely reject it and you want to express something completely different. That's something like the intellectual world that we need to think of ourselves going in the direction of. So then the highlighted part, what we need to do is avoid hinting that this suggestion, whatever it is that we're doing, get something right, that my philosophy corresponds to the way things really are. Right? Trying to get things right to correspond to the way things really are, that's what small o objectivism is about. And that's what we're not doing anymore as postmodern. We're not interested in objectivity. It's a chimera. It's a mess. It's a bankruptcy. We are going to then go the opposite. Poets are leading the way some sort of deep subjectivity is at work. All right, next slide, please. Now, what do we do in response to that? Stanley Fish, longtime professor at Duke University, then came to Illinois, uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, very good Milton scholar, I understand. I only have amateur knowledge of this stuff, but he's also a very deep guy and a, and a graceful writer. 
Deconstruction, which is a, a literary method of postmodernism applying to literary texts that's uh, uh, most famously associated with Derrida. And uh, Fish here is arguing that if we take deconstruction seriously, as he does, what does this mean for practice? Particularly, what does it mean for practice when we, as literary critics, are analyzing poems and other works of fictional literature? And he's again indicating this concern with objectivity and getting our interpretations right and seeing the text as a body of symbols and semantic units that need to be interpreted correctly, that we can have rational arguments and slowly work our way toward the proper interpretation. All of that is wrong. Deconstruction relieves me of the obligation to be right. You don't have to be right. Let's just not talk about right anymore and demands only that I be interesting. That's the job of a intellectual literary critic. Well, what's interesting? Well, as we know, right, well, what's interesting to you and what's interesting to me are going to be highly relative, subjective, and so forth. So we become intellectually playful, and there is a wing of postmodernism that goes in this direction. Let's just have fun and get away from this notion that truth really matters a whole lot. There's another important wing, though, of postmodernism that comes out directly on the heels of this. Next slide, please. And this is uh, 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 Fish's colleague while he was at Duke University, another English professor, uh, Franklin Thrickia. And what he's arguing then is to say, if we take postmodernism seriously, this precisely means that we need to reject and overturn entirely that liberal arts education model that the, model, the, the modernists were all about. That our job is to cultivate in our students a respect for evidence and reason, to train them to get rid of the biases in their mind and practice certain intellectual virtues. Instead, if we're not going down that route at all, this then is where we go. So postmodernism seeks not to find the foundation and the conditions of truth. Okay, that's old news now. Truth is out. But what we are left with then is power. And particularly when you are a professor, you are in a power relation. You have power over your students. And how should you use that power? Not as traditional liberal arts education suggested, but rather exercise power for the purpose of social change. You want to change society. And okay, well, you know, maybe we we'll say that's fine, uh, but changing in what direction if we don't know what the objectively true direction for society to go is. One's task as a professor is to help students, quote, spot, confront, and work against the political horrors of your time. So once again, we have now the John Gray assumption. We live in horrible times, horrible times brought about by the Enlightenment. That we take for granted. Your job as a professor is to teach the students how awful their society is, and then more narrowly, politically, how horrible it is. So your job is to train political activists, and that's how you should use your power. All right, next slide, please. Andrea Dworkin, we're talking about postmodernism in, in general. Um, postmodernism in general on the value side believed in universal human rights. Uh, Enlightenment liberals have been concerned with extending civil rights, extending political rights, getting rid of double standards in the law and in various cultural institutions now for two and a half centuries. And the idea is that ultimately we should achieve genuine liberty and equality for all human beings. Dworkin is arguing that is not going to be possible. Right? The claim about universal truths and objective values, we have to dispense of that. The reality is, again, power. And when we look at power in a particular set of dimensions, in this case, she's focusing on male-female relations, males have the power, and they are interested in exercising power against women and using women for their own ends. Now, the crude language, you can read that for yourself, but uh, 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 the argument then is that all of this talk about right, respect and mutual respect and, uh, and, and mutually beneficial interactions, that is, again, fundamentally flawed. That Enlightenment claim is also out. We should recognize social relations for the conflictual power struggle 
that they are between groups. We might be interested in other groups. Uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, he's famous. He's actually a brilliant, brilliant mind uh, uh, and a very good writer, clearer than a lot of the other postmoderns. So agree with him or not, he is definitely worth your time for reading. Uh, he is also the one who uh, uh, more broadly gave the formulation that postmodernism is a suspicion of all uh, narratives, particularly all meta-narratives. That what we're just left with is stories, narratives, not truths or, or, or scientific theories and so on. But if we're interested in understanding the world, again, we have to reject this enlightenment idea that what we're interested in is universal rights, universal liberty, equality, peace for all mankind, or all humankind, as we should say. Instead, what we should recognize again is that that's a fraud, it's not true, the reality just is power. In this case, it's not men have the power and women don't, but rather some nations have the power and others don't. And those nations that want to advance their interests internationally, of course they will fly the flag of truth, liberty, and justice, and so on. But really what's going on is they are grabbing power and using that as a, as a cover story. And what this then means is those uh, who are the victims of the strongest powers should be recognized as victims and excused from the blaming that we typically impose upon them. So take someone like Saddam Hussein, right, from our narrative, right, he was a brutal dictator violating human rights and so we can have an argument about the justice of removing him from power, but really we need to just see him as a product. Right? He didn't make himself and it's not that the problems in Iraq were homegrown in any fundamental way. And what we have here really is uh, Lenin's uh, 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 exploitation theory applied internationally. Mussolini or Hitler, Mussolini and France were born of the peace imposed on their countries by the victors. So Hitler, bad guy, yes, but Mussolini, bad guy, et cetera, et cetera, but not their own fault. The fault really should be shifted to the powerful Western nations and so on. And so we get the Marxist or quasi-Marxist connection here, the transfer of problems in the capitalist system. So as we in the enlightenment world are reaching our dim ruins, all of our problems, what we're trying to do is divert attention by exporting our problems to other countries that can't resist us and so on. So again, a deeply cynical analysis at work here against the idea that it's really about peace, justice, liberty, and so forth in the long run. I think I've got uh, one more, Jacques Derrida, and uh, collected these sampling different aspects of important uh, social or postmodern thought, but also the famous, the most famous names here. Deconstruction, right? sometimes it's uh, pitched as just purely a literary method. It has no real value implications or political implications and so on. And Derrida here is concerned to correct the record right, in a very important way by saying, in fact, deconstruction, however abstruse it is about semantics and syntax and theories of linguistics and so on, it ultimately comes out of a certain kind of political commitment. The way he puts it here is deconstruction never had meaning or interest, at least in my eyes, than as a radicalization, that is to say, also within the tradition of a certain Marxism in a certain spirit of Marxism. Now turning to the Q&A, here Hicks identifies what he regards as the three essential tenets of postmodernism. So I think, I think the important thing to say about postmodernism, so then we start to say, well, how many things in the postmodern package as it was developed, say, by the 60s and 70s, can you strip away and still be considered <coughs> postmodern? And I do think the, uh, the uh, seeing human beings as fundamentally socially constructed that view of human nature is one. The second one is the epistemological subjectivism uh, is another. And I think the third is the always taking the side of the perceived losers or exploited in any social and or political battle. Those three are the minimum. So, Kind of classic postmodernism then is to say we are using rhetorical strategies, anything that works, 
uh, in a society in which everybody has been socially constructed according to certain rules, but we, our sympathies are with the groups that are on the losing end of these social structures. That's classically So, like a, a sincere now, character, you can then follow up. What that then means, though, is you could say that you now believe, this would be an alt-right version, that white people, say, are on the losing end of certain social battles, and you are going to then use postmodern rhetorical strategies in this social construction battle on behalf of that. I think that would be accurately described as a postmodern alt-right. But so, if you're a sincere racist on the alt-right, or I suppose, mostly on the alt-right, right? If, so you don't believe identities are constructed but reflect some biological reality, or, or a sincere sexist, or okay. Here, Hicks briefly addresses the relationship between postmodernism and science. If you take postmodernism seriously at the fundamentals, that is in fundamental opposition to science with its commitment to facts, reality, and objectivity as, uh, as real phenomena. Uh, now, that is to pitch things at a very high level of abstraction. What you'll find is that uh, there are subsets of postmodernism who will say that we don't want to go that whole-hearted, fully skeptical, anti-realist approach. Instead, they will call themselves neo-pragmatists, and they will say things like, what we find is uh, we don't think that objectivity in any robust sense is possible, but nonetheless, we do find that certain theories and coming out of science work better than others. And so provisionally, I'm going to accept them. And so I'm backing away from the stronger Enlightenment claims. And so that's a more modest form of, uh, of, uh, of postmodernism. So I would say yeah, strong postmodernism and you know, the Enlightenment aspirations of science are on a single dimension at the opposite ends. But as we know, people uh, come in, uh, are skeptical in various degrees. People are relativistic in varying degrees. So there can be semi-postmodernisms that could be worked out. Here, Hicks elaborates on postmodern views and uses of language. Please forgive the echo. Here, If you are a skeptic, one of the implications is a certain view of language, that language is no longer referential about a mapping of words and, and propositions onto structures out there in reality and so on. So it is then subjectively expressive, and it's going to then be subjectively expressive of my value commitments. And so what we're doing then is using language not as a tool for kind, trying to understand the world, but rather, as you started your sentence, say, we are in disagreement situation. My language is a weapon that I'm using. So the liberal, if we can make the connection here, wants to say we, as, as John Stuart Mill did, we should see language as a tool of communication and cognition. And what we're trying to do when we're having these debates and dialogues is get ourselves on the same page cognitively to get the right uh, understanding of the world. But if you have abandoned getting a right understanding of the world, but we still have language, and it does seem to be a useful tool, well, what's it a useful tool for? And then we say it's useful for either expressing your agenda or for advancing your agenda. And so what many of the postmoderns will say is, well, we do happen to live in a world where people take the appearance of argument seriously. And some people take argument seriously. So if I want to achieve my power goals, I might just become a physical activist and go out and beat people up. Or I might become a politician and use my power. But if I like words, or if I'm an academic and I want to then be more intellectual in my agenda approach, then I will see language as a rhetorical weapon. And that what I have learned is that if I use certain formulations, that puts people on the defensive. Right? Somebody says an opinion and I say, oh, that's really racist of you. How does the person react? Well, they're immediately put on the defensive. Right? And that's good, because a person who's on the defensive is a little bit more vulnerable. And they're trying to figure out what their defense against the racism charge is going to be. Now, do I necessarily have to think that the person really is a racist? to say that. Well, I might or I might not, or I might just find this is just a really useful rhetorical tool to use to put people on the defensive. And then I can use various other arguments. Now, an analogy that we might use, and this ties into right, I think your question about old-fashioned lying versus postmodern right, uh, uh, lying and so on, is to say if we think about lawyers, 
uh, uh, very crudely, there are two kinds of lawyers when they go into a courtroom. A lawyer, a courtroom, there's going to be a lot of discourse, a lot of argument, and so on. But there's a difference between the lawyer who says, ultimately, for all of its failings, the law ultimately is striving for truth. It's striving for justice. And we go through this messy adversarial process with lots of rules of evidence and who can say what under what circumstances because we think that's our best shot at getting to objective truths about guilt and innocent. And it's not going to be perfect. We're going to make lots of mistakes. But that's my commitment to the process. Uh, I believe in truth, I believe in justice, and I believe in the procedures of the law as our best chance of getting there objectively. But we know there's a whole other category of lawyer. When they go into the courtroom, they're not interested in truth, they're not interested in justice, they're not interested in the appropriateness of the procedures. Instead, what are they interested in? They are interested in power. There is a legal power in this room, and I want that power to be wielded on my client's behalf, and I am going to use any rhetorical tool that I can get away with in order to achieve my value agenda in this case. It's not about truth. There is no truth. It's not about justice. There is no justice. The procedures are just there to be manipulated by the most rhetorically powerful in this case. And so that's a very different strategy, and that's closer to postmodernism. Here, Hicks discusses some inherent and oft-noted tensions in postmodernist thinking. We might, for example, say, right, all morals are relative and everything is subjective, but then 10 minutes later we are saying, no, no, racism is really evil. Sexism is really evil. Uh, or that you know, all cultures are equally worthy of respect and so on. But then 10 or 20 minutes later, we are harshly criticizing some culture for some practice or that engage. And that does seem to be a logical contradiction. Now, there's a few ways to, uh, to square this. One is to say that, well, <clears throat> um, I just have my strong subjective opinions about these matters. And when I have my philosopher brain engaged, I will say I don't think that I can justify my commitments as true. But they are my subjective commitments, and so I'm just going to go for it. So you have a discussion with me about epistemology. I'll talk to skeptical relativistic talk. But as soon as it switches to values, well, I'm switching hats, and I just live with the contradiction. Uh, particularly if we are Marxists and neo-Marxists, or Hegelians and neo-Hegelians, or Heideggerians and neo-Heideggerians, all of those philosophies explicitly say contradiction is not that serious a matter. And so one of the things that they will just do is to say, OK, well, it's a contradiction, but so what? Right? Everything fundamentally is, is, is contradictory. It's only enlightenment epistemology that has a problem with contradiction, and I've, I've gone past that. So I'll just live with it. Here, Hicks discusses social constructionism, especially linguistic and cultural constructionism, and how these theories fed into postmodernism. Uh, so the question is, what is the connection between social constructionism and postmodernism more generally. Uh, yeah, social constructionism is a, 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 a subset right, of postmodernism right, more general. It's a thesis that says that what we take to be reality, and we all have some view about reality, is not a, an objective, real reality, but it is a product of social forces. So uh, it's not the case that what we call reality exists independently of us and that we objectively study it and learn it on its own terms. Instead, there are social forces that operate us, that construct in us a view of reality. Now, one approach to this is not the only one, though, is, is, uh, is a, a linguistic route. And it's one that's favored by many of the uh, people who come to postmodernism through deconstruction. And so what they will say is, and this is a theory that started to be developed in the early 20th century by people who were not postmoderns, but what they would argue is some sort of a tabula rasa theory of the mind. So you're born into a society, but it's completely arbitrary what society that you are born into. You could have been born into this one or that one. But different societies have different languages, and the different languages have different grammars. And you then are 
when you're learning a language, your plastic mind is just absorbing the structure of that language. Uh, but built into that grammar, including certain semantical principles right, that you learn, is a certain view of the world. And so you grow up thinking in terms of that language, but we're now thinking of language in not as a tool that puts you in contact with reality, but rather as a kind of filtering, structuring mess thing, that, uh, a thing that goes on to make your mind and your view of reality. So what we then say is your resulting view of reality is a product of your language. But language is a social product, and therefore your view of reality is socially constructed. Then we can add relativism just by saying, well, different languages have different grammars, different syntax, different semantics, and so on. And so there are going to be different views of reality out there, each of them socially constructed. Uh, kind of uh, social relativism follows from that because then it's impossible for me to think outside of the language that I was born in, just as it's going to be impossible for you if you're not a native Canadian English speaker to think outside of your framework. And so really we're not going to be able to uh, uh, get our theories on the same page. So uh, uh, there's a famous uh, early 20th century thesis called the Sapir-Whorf thesis. These guys were not postmodernists, but they advocated a version of that. And that was very influential on proto-postmodern uh, uh, theory. Uh, uh, many of the early 20th century anthropologists would, uh, through their more empirical studies, just say any principle you want to find, there is no universal agreement, any value principle, any metaphysical understanding of reality, they're all different and so they will generalize to say therefore we can't step outside of our socially constructed framework we're just left with different views uh, and so on. And then uh, adding that to the epistemological stuff that comes out of the philosophers, you get then a robust um, um, uh, postmodern theory that really integrates all of them. Here, Hicks discusses how, according to epistemological non-skeptics, human beings can overcome their biases. So uh, I think the claim is, from the postmodern perspective, that everyone has biases, and in that respect, that's not a very controversial claim because everybody will recognize that there are biases. The postmodern claim is that the biases are inescapable. That what we've been trying to do with scientific method and so forth is find ways to overcome various biases. And we believe that all of those attempts are subject to skeptical attacks and they can't be answered. So we are stuck in uh, a skeptical bias framework. So everything really is subjective. So when they then hear someone like me who says, well, uh, I'm making these arguments and I'm presenting to you, what they then have is their rhetorical strategy to say, well, that's just your bias right, that is speaking. And sometimes the bias will come out and say, well, you're, you're speaking as a white man and so you have white male biases. And that's just taking it as axiomatic as a, as a dismissing point, right? Or you, uh, uh, maybe you're from Europe or if it's a more ethnic, right, and so on. So what the claim then has to be on the other side, and this is the Enlightenment project as an ongoing, is to say whether the biases are, are inherent in us or not, right? that there are you know, mental blocks uh, or whether we uh, learn biases, let's abstract away from that issue. Of course, there always is temptations that we are going to face to be biased in various ways. Uh, that I come up with a hypothesis and I like this hypothesis because I'm the guy who came up with it. And we know that it's very hard for people to be self-critical about hypotheses that they came up with. Then the question is going to be, is it possible for individuals to learn the intellectual virtues of being self-critical. For example, then to say, here is my hypothesis and I really like it, but I'm going to do my experiments in a double blind fashion to try to take my bias out. And is that a successful way of doing it, right? Or I am intentionally going to take my ideas and ask other people whom I know who are smart and disagree with me to subject them to the best criticisms. And I'm going to do it in a public venue so that I can't ignore those criticisms and I'm going to do my best to respond to those criticisms. So the Enlightenment 
side wants to say, no, the issue is not that we're not fallible. Of course we're fallible. It's not that we are limited. It's not that we don't come from backgrounds, and particularly when we're younger and we're uncritical, we absorb certain beliefs. The question is, is it impossible for us with intellectual honesty to individually unlearn certain habits? and to consistently practice certain intellectual virtues, and then socially develop certain kinds of institutions, like uh, 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 publishing your data, right? uh, so you can't fudge the data privately, like going through peer review, and that we have various institutional checks that will weed out the biases so that if we take all of that project serious, and it's going to be hard, at some points we can say, no, we're certain. We've got knowledge. This is objective. So that's, that's the project. But working all of that out, that takes philosophers and scientists working together. Here, Hicks gives his opinion on hate speech. Well, I would say that the shunning from society is the right way. Uh, and that is a fundamentally liberal way of dealing with people whom you judge to be beyond the pale. Now, the question is, uh, how do you define hate speech and distinguish that from free speech? That's not how I look at it, because I believe hate speech should be part of free speech. And my reasons for that would be, I think there are, you know, that hate is a legitimate human emotion and that hate is a perfectly rational and appropriate value response to some phenomena. So I'm quite happy to say that I hate Nazis. I do. And I think I should be able to, in a public venue, including a college classroom, express my opinion that I hate Nazis. I hate serial rapists. I hate child molesters. There's lots and lots of people right, that I hate. So I don't think it's appropriate in many contexts. Now, there are going to be contexts, specialized contexts, to say that in principle, certain human emotions are just off limits, and you're not allowed to express those. That's just destructive of human valuation and the reality of, of human emotion. Now, then the question is going to be, uh, since we know that expressions of hate typically don't lead to productive dialogue, then when we are in context where we think productive dialogue is very important, we should have a strategic principle in place about how we're going to deal with discussions of topics that are likely to generate very strong emotions, including emotions of hate. And so the way I think that should be done and I'm only going to speak as a professor here, say that this is a specialized institution. If you take the college classroom, what we are interested in is, uh, on my view, classic liberal arts education model. We want people to be exposed to all of the important viewpoints, and they should also know the hateful ones. Right? Uh, and students need to work through them, because they, uh, every generation is going to confront them in one way, shape, or form. Uh, and we should uh, encourage people to be able to express their opinions about them, and we know that people are going to get heated up in the context of this. So I think the most important thing would be for the professors themselves to see themselves as role models, for the professors to show students how I can say that I hate Nazis, but nonetheless I can discuss Nazis objectively, and I can present the arguments that the Nazis made and the counter arguments and so forth, and that what we need to do is be able to learn to regulate our own emotions in a context in which we are doing that. And so professors, as a matter of principle, need to themselves have that character. And that's the only way, not the only way, but that's a primary way for students to learn. Because as we do know, students uh, hopefully respect their professors and try to model it. Now what I also then think is that when uh, 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 things that you think are inappropriate, and there are going to be lots of things that come up in freewheeling philosophical and political discussions in class, people are going to say things that are inappropriate that they don't necessarily even believe that we know that people say things in the heat of the moment. How should we react to that? And it's a cliche, but I think professors should say this is a teaching moment. Uh, how do we respond? Rather than becoming the censor, and becoming the intellectual uh, the authoritarian and saying, you can't do that, I'm going to penalize you for doing that. To say, I disapprove right, of what you're doing and show how you express disapproval in a civil fashion. Give the student a warning. If the student is being disruptive of the learning that's going on in a class beyond a certain point, I do think the professor should have 
the authority to say, look, we are here for discussion. You're clearly at the point of disruptiveness. I'm just going to ask you to, to leave. Uh, but that's a shunning, as you put it, and I think that's how it should be done. So here Hicks summarizes his meta-ethics. There is a line that goes from Aristotle to Locke to Nietzsche to Rand that is the most promising line here. And all of them are kind of biological functionalist fundamentally in their, their meta-ethics. So if you think, uh, uh, I don't want to turn this into a whole meta-ethics letter, but where do we get our moral standards from? And then there are, are you know, four main theories. One is God or the gods just to lay them on us. It's a divine command theory. Uh, uh, or they are just based on pleasure pain that's built into <laughs> us biologically. Or we, uh, we make them up socially, kind of a social subjectivism. Or if we don't think any of those are adequate, we're kind of nihilistic. So the theory I think that works best is a uh, technically a biological functionalism. So the way to think about it, I think, is before we get to the really complicated human cases, is to think of a simpler biological case. So if you think of um, like a fish, for example, and you're just a biologist and you're studying fish, uh, and you're being purely scientific, and you start studying fish, and you say, well, the fish is in water, and um, the fish has certain needs, certain nutritional needs. Um, but it has these gills and these fins that enable it to be mobile in the water. So it has certain capacities. So it has these needs, say for nutrition, and it has certain capacities that enable it to, when those capacities are exercised, then get prey to satisfy its needs. Now, does it then make sense, and this is the move, this is the meta-ethical move, to say um, what's good for the fish is swimming. That if you took a fish and threw it on the land and it's trying to flop around, that that's bad for the fish. Now, what we're saying, it's bad for the fish because the fish has certain needs, but being on land, it cannot exercise its capacities in order to fulfill those needs. And we're speaking purely objectively here in terms of biological facts, but we're making a normative move. Fish on land, bad. Fish in water, able to swim, and the exercise of the swimming is good. That's good, proper, healthy for the fish to do. So what we then are saying when we're making uh, value claims is there's a fit between an organism's needs, its capacities, and the exercise of those capacities in an environment to extract what it needs to satisfy its claims. So that's the main move. And if you grant that move, then we just start saying, well, when we do morals, um, what we're looking for is to say, well, what are genuine needs of organisms? Now, human beings are more complicated, so we're going to have a much bigger list of needs. We have all of our biological needs, but we're also psychological creatures, so we're going to have psychological needs. And then if we're going to satisfy those needs, what capacities do we need to exercise? And having physical structures and psychological structures that enable us to exercise those capacities, those will be good capacities to have. We'll start using uh, language like healthy in a normative sense, where we say damaging certain structures is unhealthy because that means certain capacities can't be exercised, which means certain needs can't be satisfied. Having certain resources out in the environment is good because if we act to get those resources, that satisfies our needs and so on. So then we might be able to say something like, and this would be a more sophisticated case, is why do we say that farming is good? And that's a normative claim. Well, because we say humans have nutritional needs, but the distinctively human capacity for doing that is by thinking about things and discovering how to cultivate crops. So all of the discoveries and knowledge that early farmers made, all of that 
knowledge is good because it enables us to engage in certain actions in the environment to get resources that when we consume them satisfy our needs. And that's why farming is good. And everything is... why it was passed on. And why it was passed on as a result, yeah. So something would be a strategy like that. And then now food is already more complicated for humans than it is for animals, but then we start scaling up. And then the hardest ones are, are going to be, I think, art. Uh, you know, what, what psychological needs is art fulfilling in politics? Because then it's not just an individual human, it's, uh, it's huge numbers of, of, of people. So, but something like that. So my, uh, if I try again, so, my meta-ethics then is to say all value claims are objective to the extent that they identify human needs, the capacities and the exercise of those capacities in relation to resources in the environment. Now that we've defined postmodernism, let's turn to Hicks' central question. What factors explain the rise of postmodernism? Well, when did postmodernism rise? It rose in the late 1950s and 1960s, so what changed in the late 1950s and 1960s? According to Hicks, what changed is that around this time it was becoming impossible to make reasoned arguments in support of the political far left. Why? Because the capitalist West was outproducing the communist USSR and its satellites. Because everyone learned about Stalin's internal genocide and witnessed Soviet repression of Hungarian students on TV. So not only was capitalism outproducing communism, capitalist democracies were outperforming communist authoritarian regimes from a moral perspective. Now some abandoned their far leftism in the face of these facts, but many did not, and it is not hard to understand why. Just as religious fundamentalists have trouble abandoning their religiously inspired beliefs about objective reality, even in the face of overwhelming evidence, people with strong moral and political convictions have trouble abandoning those convictions in the face of contrary evidence. According to Hicks, the postmodernists belonged to this latter group. That is, they were among those on the far left who did not abandon their far leftism in the late 1950s and 1960s. What makes them distinctively postmodernist, though, is that they found a philosophically respectable justification for not abandoning their far leftism. That philosophically respectable justification is the aforementioned epistemological subjectivism or skepticism. One of Hicks' most controversial claims is that Immanuel Kant is the figure most responsible for setting Western philosophy on a path toward epistemological subjectivism and skepticism, and that Kant should therefore be regarded as a father of the counter-enlightenment. After Kant, epistemological skepticism penetrated Western philosophy. By the middle of the 20th century, when the first generation of postmodernists were receiving their education, skepticism about our ability to know things empirically and morally had become mainstream among both continental and Anglo-American philosophers. To be clear, the postmodernists were not driven by epistemological skepticism, according to Hicks. They were driven by their subjective left-wing political commitments, but they used epistemological skepticism as a rhetorical tool or weapon in the service of their far leftism. So if the evidence showed that capitalism was more productive than communism, postmodernists could step back and ask, can we really know which system is more productive? Are claims about different systems' productivity levels objectively true? If people pointed to the Stalinist gulags, the Maoist cultural revolution, and the Cambodian killing fields and argued that democracy was a morally superior regime type, postmodernists could step back and argue that all moral claims are subjective and arbitrary. So, it was the failure of socialism, according to Hicks, that made postmodernism necessary. The failure of Enlightenment epistemology merely made postmodernism possible. And according to Hicks, as evidence for the success of the Enlightenment continues to accumulate into the 21st century, epistemological subjectivism and verbal warfare remain useful rhetorical tools for today's postmodernists. Immanuel Kant is the most important figure in the transition from the Enlightenment to the counter-Enlightenment. He's doing his major writings in the 1780s. That's the decade that the U.S. Constitution is being formed after the revolution has been formed. Uh, has been won. French Revolution is in the offing. So that's our historical context here. And Kant, in his epistemology, and everybody, me including, recognizes Kant as uh, one of the handful of most brilliant and important philosophers of all time. And he is signaling a revolution at work here. And it's an epistemological revolution. <laughs> What he's arguing is that the Enlightenment has made very lofty and pretentious claims about the powers of empiricism and reason, that science ultimately can come to understand all the truths, and he's going to put severe limits on that epistemologically. 
But he also, in the preface to his major epistemological work, indicates that in part what's motivating him is he wants to make room for non-rational belief in God's freedom, immortality, and so on. So there's this important formulation, uh, and you can read the second preface to his Critique of Pure Reason. It's a very nice introduction to, uh, to his work. I highly recommend it or that formulation. Also in that same work, he says, in epistemology, in the theory of knowledge, we need a Copernican revolution, and he's using it metaphorically here. Uh, and the example of the language that he uses exactly is about objectivity and subjectivity. We have for centuries, when we were doing philosophy, said the truth is out there, right? not in the Area 51 sense, right? but just that there is an ob objective world and our minds need to conform to the way things are really in the world because that's what we mean by truth, some sort of mapping of the mind onto an independently existing objective reality. And Kant's saying, you know, we've been trying this for centuries and we've got all these very powerful skeptical arguments that have been developed and I think they are unanswerable. So what we need to do is to do a flip and say knowledge doesn't depend on the object, it depends on the subject. And so just as Copernicus is offering an astronomical revolution, I'm offering an epistemological revolution, abandon objectivity in the direction of subjectivity. On my reading of the history of philosophy, given the power of Kant's mind and the brilliance of his arguments, uh, we are still largely philosophically working within a Kantian universe, and postmodernism is going to be one manifestation of that some generations as the implications of this Copernican shift get worked out. I'll carry on to the next slide here, but I do wanna just march to show that from the Enlightenment era, particularly in the 1700s, when there's enormous intellectual and cultural prestige for reason, the philosophers are increasingly abandoning reason. Kant, dies in 1804, I think it is. Uh, let's all do the Wikipedia fact check on that at some point before quoting. But if we jump then 40 years later, here's Kierkegaard, and everybody reads Kierkegaard in their philosophy classes. But notice what Kierkegaard is saying, right, epistemologically. One must crucify reason. That's the exact opposite, right, of valorizing reason. And if we're interested in having a genuinely meaningful philosophy of life, we have to make a, quote, leap, a subjective leap into something that you fully recognize is absurd. Right? You can't make sense of it rationally, but you really want to believe it and you make the leap. Right, now we're very much away from the Enlightenment in this particular tradition. We jump another 40 years to Nietzsche. Nietzsche writing sprinkled with contemptuous, disdainful remarks about reason, the intellect, uh, uh, and so forth, how pitiful, how shadowy and fleeting, how aimless and capricious the human intellect is. Very much anti-enlightenment at this point. And Nietzsche is certainly one of the great heroes of most strains of postmodernism, and justly so in some respects. Jumping another 40 years, no, no, the, I'm still on this slide, sorry, to uh, the, now the 1920s, Martin Heidegger, uh, again, a, a towering mind, brilliant, love him or loathing. You have to grapple with Heidegger if you're going to do 20th century philosophy. But notice what he's saying here, just this quotation. If this contradiction, he's pointing out some problem that has been reached in, uh, in his metaphysical studies. This contradiction breaks the sovereignty of reason. Right? So that's our goal, to break the sovereignty of reason. He's going to say, well, so be it. We'll have to live with that. Then the fate of the rule of logic is also decided. So, Reason is out, logic also is out. Logic, and now we've got the quotation marks going on, disintegrates in the vortex of a more original question. So if we're really gonna get to the origin and really do serious philosophy, logic and reason are not going to be the way for us to do that. Now these are typically uh, important figures in the continental tradition. There are various splits in, in philosophy in the modern world. But if we jump over to philosophers who are important to the more analytic and positivistic schools that have do dominated the American Academy, British Commonwealth Academy. Uh, I've got one here. This is Rudolf Carnap, another big name. Now we're into the 20th century. Metaphysics, 
all value and normative theory, logical analysis yields a negative statement, blah, blah, blah. The alleged statements in this domain are entirely meaningless. And remember Foucault saying knowledge, truth, and so forth, meaningless, right? generation earlier. Right? That's basically all of philosophy, right? meaningless. And that's the best philosophers and where they are in this tradition. Uh, that's to focus on matter, but then another philosopher in the 1950s, this is the important decade. Now pretty generally accepted, I think as a journalistic claim, this is uh, relatively true of where the profession was. F professional philosophers that ultimate ethical principles must be arbitrary. So the claims then of all of the Enlightenment thinkers that rights to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, equality, peace, and so forth, arbitrary commitment subjective, can't be validated, at least not philosophically. Now, that's, again, cartoon, but cartoons do have their value. Next slide, please. I want to do some biography. Uh, in my judgment, the four most important postmodern thinkers, uh, these guys will appear on everybody's top five or six list, some variations here, but Jean-Francois Lyotard, Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, and Richard Rorty, put some dates to it. Uh, all of them are getting their PhDs in philosophy, right? and all of them are doing serious work in epistemological and closely related fields here. They are at the state of the debate at the time in the early 1950s when they are coming out of graduate schools, and all of them are extraordinarily sharp individuals agree with them or not. But notice, PhD, 1958, PhD in philosophy, 1951, 1955, 1956. And so if we hadn't asked the question, these guys are all now newly minted PhDs in philosophy. What are they coming out thinking about the state of philosophy? And they then are going in their careers to become the best known postmodernists precisely because they absorb the philosophical tradition and take it to the next steps, whatever those next steps are going to be. Philosophy is in a deeply pessimistic, skeptical, relativistic, subjectivistic stage in this generation. And they are the first generation of thinkers who are going to take that seriously and work it out strategically. All right, carry on, please. So this is my first big thesis. And it's a historical thesis, an intellectual historical thesis that Postmodernism right, uh, is an epistemological movement, fundamentally, and first, but it's a counter-enlightenment. It's a rejection of the counter-enlightenment, and then I trace it back to Kant as the important thinker in the 1780s who's marking the big turn. Things get worked out slowly as, you know, things work out slowly in the academic world, and it's all complicated until we get to the middle part of the 20th century and the revolution is over for these guys. Nietzsche, again, a hero of many of the postmodernists, I'm actually taking a Nietzschean line here saying, yeah, Kant is right. As soon as we take the Kantian project, work it out, we're going to be left in gnawing and crumbling skepticism and relativism. And that's baked in fundamentally to the postmodern project. All right, next slide, please. Now, I think that's important, but I think that's only part of the story, and there's a big problem for this thesis, and the problem is going to be the next slide, politics. Isn't politics always the problem? Right? But here's the problem that I would say. Suppose <clears throat> you are a smart person, you do some philosophy, and you think about truth and knowledge, and what do we really know, and uh, are there universal things that are objective, and so on. And suppose you buy into all of the skeptical arguments in a very serious way, and you reach the point that Rorty, Foucault, Derrida, and the others reach. You say, well, you know, we don't really know anything. Uh, there is no such thing as truth. We need to at least put those in scare quotes to distance ourselves from them. Or maybe we should just reject those as all meaningless concepts and conceive of philosophy as doing something completely different. So I do that. And now I turn to value questions. What should I do? What should I believe? What should I commit to? What should my morals be? What should my politics be? But I'm doing all of this absent any belief in truth, knowledge, 
and so forth as significant concepts. Now, it seems to me that if, say, we just take the people in this room, suppose all of us were deeply skeptical, deeply subjectivistic, and we say, okay, there's no right politics. It's subjective in some fundamental way. You're on your own. And then we start asking people, well, what politics have you committed to, all of you? And we go around individually. How many different views of politics should we expect to have right, just in this room? And recognizing this is actually a pretty narrow <laughs> segment demographically of society, right? College people at a really good college. Right? Okay. But what would the range of political opinion be in this room? Uh, pretty wide. All over that. But what we do not find when we look at the postmoderns is a wide range of political opinions being espoused. Instead, what we find is that all of the major postmoderns, and you run through the list starting in the 1960s of the big guns, these four and their followers and the other people who are second tier, and what you find is that all of them, however you think of the political spectrum, goes from here to here, whatever that is, they're all over here, every single one of them. Top 50, top 100, right? I've done the count, but you do the count yourself, and you see if in the first generation you find any significant postmodern thinkers who are not significantly far left in their political outlook. And that strikes me as a problem, because if, skepticism and relativism is fundamental, then we should predict people to be all over the map. But we don't. We do not have that. We have a narrow. So next slide, please. What are this the uh, slide here? Derrida, politics, very radically left, right, self-described, right, edited and co-edited, various uh, neo-Marxist right, publications, uh, just self-described as a man of the left, Foucault, I right, was a member of the French Communist Party for a few years in the early 50s. Broke with them when the Stalinism got too, uh, too strong. And it seemed that the French Communists were just taking you know, blind marching orders to anything that Moscow said. He said, that's too much, I'm out. But in the 1960s, with the rise in Mao and Mao's version of Marxism, he's, Maoism is the way to go. Right? And so he's a Maoist right, for years. But consistently through his careers, he's on the left and pretty far right to the left. Jacques Derrida, very sympathetic to the Communist Party, didn't go so far as to join, but published in their journals. That was his social and intellectual circle. Richard Rorty, as we know in the American context, uh, Communist Party has never been very strong, uh, but uh, in the American, for right to left, however you characterize that, I guess this is my left over here, Rorty is really as far left as you can go in kind of this, the standard American distribution as well. And then that would carry on. Andrea Dworkin, Stanley Fish, Franklin Trickia, the others that I've named, and then the other ones that you would. So what's going on? Politics has to be part of the story, not just epistemology and theories of metaethics. Next slide, please. So let's talk about Uncle Carl. All right. All right. Of course, we always have to talk about Uncle Carl. Okay. Karl Marx, co-author, 1848, Friedrich Engels, Communist Manifesto. That's a political tract. Sometimes uh, we forget that Marx also was a PhD in philosophy, and he worked out an entire systematic philosophical system of which his views on political economy really are an application. Uh, and it's a relatively sophisticated system, as you would expect from a PhD in philosophy. Uh, but if we just focus on the politics, this is 1840s, we know the rough and ready view. It's a critique of capitalism as a class system, uh, that the two classes have antagonistic economic interests, but economic interests are fundamental on the Marxist analysis. But one class has more power than the others, and so it uses that power to exploit and extract wealth from the others until the dispossessed and the exploited, they are going to realize it, but also realize that they have the value of numbers. They will form themselves an organized revolutionary class. They'll rise up in violent revolution, overthrow their 
uh, economic and political adversaries, establish for a while a dictatorship of the proletariat, and then eventually the state will wither away and we will have a true communistic version of socialism. Now, all of this is laid out in 1848 in both applied and systematic form. And as we know from studying the history of Marxism, that there are then many generations uh, of, of Marxism and many iterations of Marxism and variations that start to come to pass. But the point I want to make is that by the time we get to 1950, or if you want to be precise, you could say 1948, because that's a century from the Communist Manifesto, there is widespread disconcertedness and disquiet within far left circles. Because Marx said certain things were going to happen in capitalism. The rich were going to get richer and the poor were going to get poorer. Well, the rich are getting richer, but the poor are also getting richer. That their middle class is supposed to be squeezed out by this brutal capitalist competition. Everybody forced into either the proletariat class or a few lucky bastards clawing their way to the top of the capitalist class. But instead, the middle class is expanding hugely. The workers are supposed to be increasingly angry and alienated at the exploitation of them. But then if we look at all of the workers in the most advanced capitalist nations, they're all buying TVs and cars and going on vacations and getting fat, right? And life is pretty good. Of course, you're grumbling about the boss, et cetera, et cetera. But we have something very far from this alienated revolutionary class. And the point is that Marx had billed itself as a scientific socialism. We are making definite social science predictions. And as we know, if you are at all committed to science, you stand on your analysis of the predictions. Your theory makes these predictions. If the predictions don't come to pass, your theory is at least partially refuted. And over the course of the century, Marxists were very committed to looking at the empirical data and finding every time that they looked at the empirical data, it was not what Marx predicted. And so doing a neo-Marxism and then another neo-Marxism. And so what we have is a whole splintering of lots and lots of neo-Marxisms being developed in the early part of the 20th century. But by the time we get to 1948 and on into 1950, many, I would say the majority, particularly of Western Marxists are skeptical that Marx's scientific socialism really is scientific. And so something more radical is necessary. Now at the same time, there's the moral side of socialism. And socialism has always been driven by the idea that capitalism is immoral, evil. It's based on competition, exploitation, and so forth. And socialism is going to be about sharing and cooperation and everyone being equal. And so we have a very different set of moral ideals. And so capitalism can't possibly be a humane and dignified system. Also important in the 1950s, after things settled down, end of World War II, the fascists are gone, the Nazis are gone. It's really come down basically to the US and its allies, the Soviet Union and its allies, and it really doesn't get much clearer than that. The nation of the Enlightenment, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, markets, and so on, versus the great experiment in socialism being led by Joseph Stalin. And it is an economic collision, and it's a moral collision, and that's the Cold War. Unfortunately, it was cold for most of the war, not an actual hot war. But in the 1950s, what happened? Stalin died. A few years later, Nikita Khrushchev has consolidated power, and in a secret speech that actually was meant to be publicized, he announced that in fact, under Lenin, and then increasingly under Stalin, the Soviet Union had been engaged in the most brutal internal genocides in history. The communists in China are yet to come. That in fact, deliberate starvation of millions of Ukrainians, no due process, shooting anybody who might be a class enemy, torture on a widespread scale, pe shipping people to the gulag where they are systematically starved and or worked to death. And the death toll is in the millions. And of course, 
Western liberals and Western capitalists had said, no, there's all this terrible stuff going on in the Soviet Union, but we can't say that's just CIA propaganda anymore because the now premier of the Soviet Union is admitting, yes, in fact, that happened. But socialism was supposed to be about morality and caring about your people and humanity and so on. And it's supposed to be the capitalists who are doing horrible things to their people. And no matter how blinkered you are in your political philosophy, this was shattering. And when you read the documents and the discussions among people in the far left in the 1950s, it is a crisis of faith, a fundamental crisis of faith. And the claim then is Marx's predictions, they're crap, it's not scientific. The capitalists are doing well. Of course, we've got all sorts of criticisms, but they are so puny and insignificant compared to the criticisms that we can make about what happened in the Soviet Union. And then also we have to remember 1956, again, put yourself in the shoes of being Richard Rorty or Michel Foucault. You are a young, idealistic socialist. And what happens in Hungary in 1956? Well, most of you I know are too young to know. But Hungary is a satellite state of the Soviet Union with essentially a puppet government in place. But the socialist economy is doing terribly. Uh, workers are, 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 are very hungry, widespread unemployment. Students your age are going to university classes and they are just being indoctrinated in communist educational system. They want to read real stuff and they know that there are other arguments out there they want actually to learn. So there's worker protests, there are student protests peacefully in the streets. And what does the humane, caring Hungarian communist government do? Call up Moscow, we got trouble, and Moscow sends in the tanks, sends in the troops. People are shot, the ringleaders are rounded up, they are tortured. Tanks run over people on the street. And what's significant is that this is, for the first time, technically possible, worldwide television. Everybody can see it. And this is awful. So what we have then in the 1950s, next slide please. We need a new left. And postmodernism comes out as part of this new left. The old left is dead. We need a new strategy. What's that new strategy going to be? Well, strategy needs strategists. That needs people who are extremely smart, who are extremely well-read, who can think to the fundamentals of things. And on, by those criteria, Foucault, Derrida, Rorty, and Lyotard, they prove themselves. And they advance the new strategy. What is the new strategy? Well, we use skepticism and we use relativism. Now, a little bit before, I used the language of faith, saying it's a crisis of faith. And so maybe an analogy will help here. So if you think about if you are a religious person, <clears throat> you believe that your religion is true, and you want it to be true. But it's not just an abstract set of truths. You think it's important, it's noble, it's beautiful. It forms your very soul identity, your commitment to your religion. But suppose you are also smart, and you start arguing with other people about religion, and they've got really good arguments against your beliefs, and you find yourself losing these things. And you can't any longer rationally convince yourself that your religion is true. And so we have the standard crisis of faith that people have. On the one hand, I really want this to be true. On the other hand, my reason is not convinced. In fact, I'm somewhat skeptical. Conflict between what your reason tells you and what you want to be true. How do you handle that? And that's a very stark choice that thoughtful, sensitive people go through every generation. And we know people make the opposite choice. Some people say, well, you know, the important thing here is not what I want to be true, but what is in fact the objective truth about the world. And if there's good evidence against my position, I need to change my position. If there's good arguments against my position, intellectual honesty demands that I pay attention to those and I acknowledge them and I alter my position. And so either I find a more rational religion or I just become increasingly agnostic and maybe even atheist. 
because objectivity, reason, and truth are fundamental, not subjective wantings. But we do know psychologically that lots of people make the other view. They say, no, I cannot give up this belief system. It is so important and value. I want to believe this. And then they find various ways to bracket, ignore, and set aside, and in some cases go on the offensive against the idea that on religious matters, evidence, argument, and so forth matters. In Kierkegaard's language, Right, they're willing to crucify reason in order to save their faith. Now, that same dynamic does not only happen in religion. It happens in lots of other domains, including politics. And so one of the claims I'm making about postmodernism is if you look at the 1950s and the early 1960s, the far left is in a crisis. It believes in its heart of hearts that socialism of some sort has to be true, noble, and it's part of their identity. We all know what it's like to be committed to our politics. We really want it to be true. But at the same time, they are very smart and they have received a first-rate epistemological education that has told them truth doesn't matter, there is no objectivity, right? and all of this evidence against the socialist agenda, we now have a strategy for bracketing and saying that doesn't matter. We can recommit to our political agenda using different strategies, including rhetorical strategies, evidence, objectivity, and all of that. Set it aside. So it's a way of saving the theory right, against some overwhelming evidence. Next slide, please. I want to uh, give the Enlightenment a chance to fight back a little bit here. So far, this is an intellectual history claim that both the left politics and the skepticism are important to postmodernism, but suppose we're interested in poverty. And the Enlightenment made some pretty grandiose claims about its ability to, through capitalism and liberalism and the Industrial Revolution, to transform the world. I want to uh, give you some data against the uh, claims about the Enlightenment leading to dim ruins and a failed society and so on. So uh, this is 1812. This is from the Gapminder site. Just go to gapminder.org. It's a Swedish site. Uh, each of these circles here is a country. Big circle, big population, right? So that's uh, China. Um, uh, these are all the European nations here. Uh, this is India. Light blue is subcontinent. And then the dark blue, those are African nations. And the yellows are the Americas. So this is the United States right here. I'm from Canada, so we always have to track the Canada data. That's a rule. There's Canada right there, a lot smaller population. This is 1812. Uh, this is income measures across the bottom, both GDP, PPP. It's all inflation adjusted. And this is people living on $400 a year, $1,000 a year, and then it's doubles, 2,000, 4,000, right, all the way up. Vertical axis is life expectancy. 20 years at birth, 25, 30, 35 years at birth. So this is a snapshot of the world as it was in 1812. And this is basically one generation after American Revolution, a generation after Industrial Revolution, and so on. Uh, Napoleon is still not solved yet in 1812. That's our time frame. But what we see is, <clears throat> we take a kind of average life expectancy is, in the 30s. Average income, the vast majority of people are living on less than $1,000 a year right, per person. So extraordinary poverty. The nations that are doing the best, this is United Kingdom, right? England primarily, birthplace of parliamentary democracy in the modern world, birthplace of industrial revolution, Adam Smith is a Brit, early capitalist theory and so on, the United States, these are all Western European nations that had adopted the Enlightenment. If you go 50 years earlier, these guys are all down in the pack. But they're starting to break away, first generation or so after adoption of the Enlightenment project. All right, now, next slide jumps 100 years. This is now 1912. What has happened in the world? And, <clears throat> The United Kingdom and the US used to be in here. Now they're way up there. 
And most of the European nations are following along. Right? Uh, the Americas, all of the uh, countries are now more or less independent in South America, Central America, and so on. They're starting to rise as well. Unfortunately, not much happening in Asia and Africa. And it seems like enlightenment just has not got there yet. So they are where they were essentially a century ago. One more uh, slide, please. Now we jump to 2012. This is data that was published in 2013. And this is essentially where the world is now, although six years later, things are still up. And now we are over here. But I want to make the point. If we just go back 200 years, every single country was in here. That's completely empty. Nobody is there anymore. We go to the really poor places of the world if we travel. Second world nations and we can't believe the poverty and then third world and we really can't believe the poverty. Those people are living longer and in many cases better than most human beings for human history. Dim ruins of the enlightenment or success of the enlightenment. That's a current debate. Now that's about poverty and of course people profess to be about poverty. If we are really interested in solving the problem of poverty, it does seem that we should take the Enlightenment's track record seriously. But if you're committed to certain philosophical and or political agendas that want to give credit for solving lots of poverty to political philosophies, economic philosophies, and so on that you think are repugnant, that's very hard for people to do. And that's an intellectual honesty issue. All right, that's poverty. Suppose we're interested in sexism and racism. Of course we're interested in sexism and racism. They are bad things and we want to get rid of them. So, uh, actually I won't presume to speak for all of you, but uh, let's argue about that if you want, that's fine. Let's look at some data here. This is just American data. Uh, slide pulled from the Department of Education site. This is degrees granted to women throughout much of the 20th century. So go back to 1920, different kinds of degrees. You can read the color coding and so on. But how are we doing on providing educational opportunities to women over the course of the 20th century in the United States? Have we perfectly solved all problems with respect to sexism? Well, no, of course not. But we're making progress. And how much progress should we expect to be able to make? Well, that's a fairly significant progress over the course of one century, actually less than a century. The numbers are significantly uh, increased. You know, those trend lines continue and so on. All right, that seems to me like a success. That's not dim ruins, uh, particularly if you are a woman or particularly if you like intelligent, educated women. Right? That's also a success. Right? Racism. Right? Well, if you remember 400 years ago, basically nobody in the world had a problem with slavery, just the natural order of things. Of course, we beat you in war. We can conquer you, take your women, make you slaves. That's, that's just what happens. Right? Or, right, you people different from us are, of course, you're a lesser order of human and no problem. It's only in the 1600s, 1700s, that increasingly we start to have moral objections to slavery, racism, and increasing number of intellectuals start to say we have to respect individuality. We need to start to form movements, then political movements, sometimes war over the course of another century or so. And then if we go to 1750, that's an astonishing number. Over 70% of the world's population is either a serf, a peasant, or a slave. And down. That also looks like an Enlightenment success story to me. And the biggest gains happen first and most significantly in the nations that adopted Enlightenment philosophy in various forms. One other uh, thing, next slide please. This is a survey, this was published in the Washington Post, but they're drawing from the original social science. If you just Google uh, Washington Post survey on this, this will take you to all of the original data. Uh, but this is uh, saying of uh, people in all over the world, 
Are you uh, comfortable with having someone of another race as a neighbor? That was one of many questions they asked, gauging people's racial and ethnic attitudes and so on. And uh, what you find is the blue countries are countries where 95% or more of the population said, I have no problem with someone of another race being a neighbor. And then the lighter blue, right, it's increasing. And then the areas that then become redder, those are more number or percentage of the population saying, yeah, I, I kind of don't want to have people of a different race, right, and so on. So, Again, that seems like a success story to me, but uh, again, if you look where most of the blue nations are, it's the nations that adopted enlightenment philosophy and applied it systematically. Northwestern European nations, for the most part, France is an unusual exception there, but the Americas, right, as the new countries, perhaps uh, racial attitudes don't, since they're new, uh, the traditional racial attitudes don't have to take hold. Some of the Commonwealth nations uh, and so on. And again, that's not perfect. That's the whole world, but that looks like partial success and significant success to me. So, next slide, please. Thanks, Brian. I'm going to say it's a fact right, that the progress right, is real. And uh, of course, I'm using philosophically charged words. I'm saying there is a reality. I'm saying that we can state certain facts about reality, objective facts, right? and that those are good facts, right? progress, yes, and we know what progress looks like. Now that's just rhetorically to push back against the postmodern claims. I do not want in any way to diminish the importance of engaging with the philosophical arguments. The postmoderns have very good first-rate epistemological arguments. They have to be addressed, but they're also first-rate arguments epistemologically on the other side as well. We need to get up to speed on those as thoughtful intellectual people. That's one of the fundamental debates. But we also have lots of empirical data, and if you're interested in the empirical data, that should bear on how we evaluate both broadly the Enlightenment project and the postmodern claims about the Enlightenment project. During the Q&A session, as a brief aside, Hicks said that social constructionism, according to him, an essential tenet of postmodernism, may also come from Marxism. Now, one way of looking at this is uh, to say that really that social constructionism is built into Marxism as early as the 1840s, because Marxism does start with a very strong environmental determinist thesis. You know, he goes far as to say there is no such thing as human nature. You are born entirely plastic, and what you are is entirely a product of the environmental circumstances within which you are raised. Uh, so and, and he's very explicit about this. Right? Your mind is social mind, your, your social circuit. There is no individual mind that is able to look at reality, sense it, form your own views. You are totally a social product. And then his view is that there are, it's the different economic classes that are constructing the minds of the kids that are born in those classes differently, and so they're necessarily in clash with each other. Here, Hicks elaborates on Kant's Copernican revolution and epistemology. I do think that Kant is the most important philosopher of the last 250 years. Uh, even though, from my perspective, that's a, a fatal misturning. Right? But nonetheless, I think objectively, he is the most important person to reckon with. And Kant rose systematically on all major branches of philosophy, aesthetics, politics, less systematic on political theory, but certainly in ethics, uh, underlying views of human nature and the epistemology. In all of that, I do think from him, his views on epistemology are the most important. So Critique of Pure Reason, I think, is the most important text in modern philosophy getting into the weeds about Kant's uh, Copernican revolution and the shift away from, from, uh, from objectivity. And I think there are uh, two important things that are going on. One is the empiricist commitment that's built into science. So if we're going to say everything should be put to 
experimental test. Ultimately, experiments cash out and say, look at this test tube, right? or look at this measurement, or listen to this sound, and so forth. So what that means is that fundamentally, we have to believe that our senses are giving us accurate information about the way reality is. Right? So we have some directness there. Or in our initial data gathering stage, before we get too scientific about things, we are objectively through our senses gathering data and on the basis of that we form conceptual schemes and hypotheses and so on. So uh, what Kant though is doing is challenging that empiricist commitment. Right? And he's drawing on then almost two centuries of skeptical arguments that had been mounted against Locke, then Berkeley, then Hume, uh, to say, well, the senses are subject to illusions, or senses are relative, or we can't tell the difference sometimes between dreams and, uh, and, uh, and perceptions and so on. And, and what he's doing then is arguing that in principle, whatever we call a perceptual awareness, it can't be a direct connection to reality. It's some sort of mediated, filtered, structured by subjective somethings or others. And so that empiricist commitment fails. So uh, we need a better empiricist understanding of how perception works. The other thing I would say is that when we do <clears throat> uh, science or sophisticated reasoning, we're using math, we're using stats, we're using uh, logic. And all of those operate at a fairly high level of abstraction. And the other big level we, uh, uh, challenge we have is showing that our abstract logical principles and our abstract rules about what you need to do with mathematics and any abstract concept that we use has a connection to actual reality. So if I say, for example, just to use, you know, that everyone in this room is a human being. So I've got this abstract category, humanness, and you all have that. But then when I look at each of you, you're all particular human beings, and each of you is distinct on every single dimension. No two of you have identical hair color, mass, weight. I'm not going to do this, but you don't all smell the same, and so on. So, so on every dimension, you're all unique and particular, but then I say there is this abstract thing called humanness. And there are certain general principles about what it is to be a human being. And that's what we want to come out of science, is these general abstract principles. And this picks up then the rationalist tradition that starts with Descartes and goes through Spinoza, Leibniz, and Kant is inheriting that. And the problem that that principle, uh, uh, that, that, that whole approach has had, is that it can in no way show uh, where these abstract principles come from in reality. They seem just to be general principles in our mind, but the fact that we've got general principles in our mind doesn't tell us that the world follows those general principles. So, I don't know, so we want to say something like um, the interior angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. Right. We all believe that, right? Every single triangle, right? Uh, but, you know, what's an angle, right? Have you ever like, seen an angle, and if you look at any, any triangle and you actually measure its angles, do they always add up to 180 degrees? Well, no, they never do, right? Because, you know, if you can get a more precise measuring protractor or whatever and say, well, it's actually, this one is only 179.9, right, whatever. But nonetheless, we have this abstract principle that every triangle really is interior angles 180 degrees, even though none of them actually are. So it just seems like an arbitrary construct that we are imposing on the world. Now, I'm uh, making the skeptical argument. I don't believe the skeptical argument, but what I then say is Kant is very sophisticated in saying those skeptical arguments are uh, unanswerable. And so both the empirical perceptual claim and the rationalist claim that these abstract principles tell us something about the world, they're both false. So objectivity is dead in the water and we have to be subjectivistic. Here, Hicks discusses the often underappreciated influence of Jean-Jacques Rousseau on postmodernism and the contemporary far left. Hicks views the contemporary far left as more neo-Rousseauian than neo-Marxist, and he says it's debatable whether Kant or Rousseau is the more pivotal counter-enlightenment thinker. I also think Jean-Jacques Rousseau is extraordinarily important. And I don't think he's as deep a philosopher, but I think in terms of intellectual history, Rousseau is important 
not for epistemological reasons, but for political reasons. Uh, that what we find in Rousseau is a, an early counter-enlightenment political thinker. So he's very much opposed to basically everything the Enlightenment stands for, and he's very rhetorically articulate uh, at developing a counter-enlightenment, a rather authoritarian, egalitarian, collectivist understanding of politics. So I don't know if you want to call him outright a socialist, but he's certainly strongly an authoritarian socialist of some sort, some proto-sort. And I do think this is important because uh, on my reading right now of where left thinking is, that Marxism and neo-Marxism are actually less important. That what has happened in much of the far left is as they've abandoned various elements within Marxism, they've in effect returned to Rousseau. So for example, Marx was very much about there's a necessary logic of human development. And I don't know that very many people on the far left believe that anymore. They think things are going to be much more random and a result of human will. And that's a more Rousseauian point. That Marx was very much, uh, in one sense, in favor of the industrial capitalism developing the technological apparatus that could then, of course, be expropriated by, uh, by, uh, by the socialists. But uh, what we find is most people on the far left right now are very anti-industrial very anti-high-tech, and they seem to valorize a much more kind of tribal level, back to the earth, genuine human living. And again, that is much more Rousseauian. So uh, there are any number of other dimensions. If you were to say, well, here are the top eight things that Marx stands for, uh, a lot of those have been rejected and replaced by what I think is a more Rousseauian version. So I'm a little conflicted about whether Rousseau or Kant is more important. Now, partly this is because uh, uh, we then get into a hard issue of saying, is it the case that the way human psychology actually works is we try empirically and rationally to come up with an understanding of the world, including then secondarily what we think is good, bad, right, wrong, and do our ethics, in which case really epistemology takes precedence over value theory, or is it the case that we have various value commitments that we first uh, absorb, maybe from our families, from our environments, or just from our personal preferences, and that our rationalizing comes a little bit later, and what it's doing is just trying to fit our already adopted value framework to our understanding of the world, in which case values take a little more precedence over uh, the epistemological issues. So the first theory would say Kant then is a little more important than Rousseau. The second that Rousseau was a little more, more, more important. Neo-Marxism has its own development and you can go through various forms of Neo-Marxism without it all being postmodern. But you do get to certain dead ends with respect to Marxism, even if you're trying to be realistic and scientific about your Marxism. But Postmodernism also allows you certain rhetorical and epistemological tools that you can strategically use with your neo-Marxism. But, uh, and again, I haven't written this up yet, although it's, it's, it's in, my, in the book sprinkled through, that I do think the better label is neo-Rousseauian. That there's a lot more people now who are new versions of Rousseau than are new versions of Marx even though the neo-Rousseauians got there from postmodern epistemology and neo-Marxism, but they've evolved into <coughs> Here, Hicks argues that opponents of postmodernism must engage postmodernists philosophically, as postmodernist political strategies rest on philosophical arguments that are quite powerful. Philosophy is more important than the politics. Uh, when you get into the philosophy, there are lots of issues in metaphysics, in our understanding of human nature, in metaethics, and I think most importantly in epistemology that need to be addressed. And all of the people who are the big names in the history of philosophy, what's important about them is that they have something to say about all of those issues. Now this is too reductionistic, but uh, if you were to make a list of important philosophical issues that need to be addressed, I think you would come up with about 40 important things. And a top 
rate, philosopher needs to have something well worked out on all 40 of those issues. And that's an, a somewhat arbitrary number. So what you're asking me right now is an impossible project because I can't you know, say, you know, Nietzsche did in fact have something to say about all 40 of those things. Here's what he said and here's my answer to all of those and then do Hegel and then do Kant and so on. That would be an entire book project and I'm working on that right now. But all I would just say is that the political manifestations are in large part driven by philosophical decisions that were made by several generations of brilliant minds. And all of those issues do need to be addressed. And we do have a multifaceted enlightenment versus postmodernist debate that's going on right now. Now, I'm on the one side, uh, 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 and uh, I guess the question just is how much time do we want to put in on it right now, and which of those issues would you say is the most important one to start with? Now we turn to the third question, how and to what extent has postmodernism affected our society? Hicks made several arguments, and a few audience members shared their own perspectives. Let's begin with Hicks' arguments. Hicks acknowledges that postmodernism is now in decline as an intellectual movement, that a decreasing number of first-rate thinkers take postmodernism seriously. As an intellectual movement taken seriously by first-rate philosophers, first-rate literary critics, first-rate historiographers, and so on, it was more prevalent in the 80s and 90s. A lot of people who are very serious thinkers have said, we don't agree with this, and they've gone on to now do positive work in their fields, and there's a lot of very good work that's being done in the humanities. At the same time, Hicks says, the number of professors who take postmodernism seriously has increased in recent decades, and these professors tend to use their academic positions to do activism rather than intellectual work. One effect has been to turn some colleges into bastions of radical, illiberal forms of left-wing activism. Specifically, Hicks argues that the traditional liberal arts model and free speech values have come under attack as colleges over the last two decades have adopted increasingly restrictive speech codes. But what has happened is an institutional shift. And I think the way it works is this. If you are, say, a graduate student and you are studying under postmoderns of the first generation, what you're going to absorb is the idea that truth, objectivity, and the quest for all of those things, that's kind of pointless. And so you're going to stop being an intellectual about it. Of course, you'll, be, you know, you'll do enough to get your PhD and get tenure and, and publish right and so forth. But you don't see yourself as engaged any longer in a serious intellectual project. You're going to take someone like Franklin Trickey's agenda seriously. You are an activist. You're not interested in theory and truth and argument and debate. You believe what you believe, and you are going to then use your position, if you have a position in the academic world, not for intellectual purposes, but for activist purposes. So what you then see is an increase in activism. We don't really have good journalism yet. We have a lot of data points. And so a bird's eye view of what exactly is going on. Is it the case that we've got 15% you know, you know, of the professoriate is postmodern intellectually, or is it only 5% or is it 40%? How many people are doing serious intellectual work? How many are really just activists pretending to be professors? We don't have good demographics on that either. In the intellectual world, and particularly in the humanities, uh, the postmoderns are mounting a revolution, and we're feeling the reverberations all through. To show how we are in revolutionary times right on this point, this is from the year 2000. I assume many of you are just being born in and around then. So this is in your lifetime, and things are moving quickly. But this is a, a speech code that was very controversial in the time, late 1990s. We started to see a surging number of speech codes at colleges and universities around the country. And the one from University of Wisconsin here being proposed was uh, uh, somewhat representative. But I want to highlight just a couple of things here. One is that we are having a speech code. Right, that now we're saying we're just ahead of time going to take certain things off the table. Certain things cannot be said, and certain things cannot be said in certain ways. Right, so we're retreating. But this is still early, because you notice uh, I've highlighted students. And the assumption of many of the early speech codes at this time was that, by and large, we faculty are already pretty enlightened. Right, and we kind of trust ourselves. But 
students, particularly students who have been uh, raised uh, in contemporary American culture, they have not gotten the right kind of message yet. And so it's students whom we can't quite yet trust with full and robust speech. They uh, need the training wheels, so to speak, on certain sets of, of issues. Also, I've highlighted the word individual here. Almost all of the early speech codes, uh, this is now half a generation ago, said our target uh, subjects are both individual students, uh, but also students speaking about other individuals. And so we're still seeing students as individuals, and we're concerned with the respect and dignity uh, of individuals, and we don't want certain things said to them. But then notice the long list of things that we have here, right? Racist language is out, discriminatory comments right, are out, but it's not only comments, it's also epithets, other kinds of expressive behavior, pretty broad category. Physical conduct, blah, 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 and then we repeat here, and then all of these things. Anything that's demeaning, uh, race, sex, religion, color, creed, disability, sexual, okay, and, and then it carries on. So, uh, by anybody's standard, that is a very broad list of things that you can't talk about negatively, whatever we take the definitional issues to be. And this is first wave. Now, over the course of the next years, there's an increasing number of colleges that adopted speech codes of various sorts here. But things started to shift again uh, in an accelerating fashion, starting about a half a dozen years or so. Here's uh, two professors, or two teachers rather, one's a professor at Yale University. They are married to each other. Uh, and the, you might recall the Halloween issue. So we're coming up to Halloween season here. And what uh, Erica Krasakis uh, did was in a, uh, in a public uh, uh, email that was going out to students was saying, Halloween is coming up here. And of course, Halloween is all about being you know, irreverent and silly and doing crazy things and outlandish and so forth. But let's also remember that we should be uh, civil right, about this and particularly in your choice of costumes and how you're going to party. Let's try to be respectful of other groups and uh, 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 not do things that are going to be, but we're still going to trust you to, to, to be free and make your own Halloween costume choices. And what was striking was that immediately they were confronted, both of them, by students, uh, organized students in confrontation. So it's no longer professors who are laying down the law to students. We now have a shift where the students right, have learned the lesson about speech codes and so forth and say, well, what's good for the goose is also good for the gander, whatever your metaphor is going to be here. And we are now going to apply this to the professors using our power base here. And also, it's not about individuals, that we are now shifting to group stereotypes. So if your costume is from another national, ethnic, or whatever orientation, it's the groupness of it, not that you are in some sense, demeaning a particular individual and targeting an individual. So that's a shift, and we start to see this increasingly in the, uh, in the discussions. Yeah, please jump on. Laura Kipnis, uh, professor uh, down the road uh, from me in Chicago at Northwestern University. In this case, uh, a different issue is being highlighted here, and that is due process. Uh, in her case, uh, there was another professor who had been uh, accused of sexual harassment and he was being investigated, but Kipnis was concerned because uh, she is a liberal left of center in her own views, but nonetheless committed to due process, presumption of innocence. And what she was concerned with was the fact that neither of those seemed to be being followed at Northwestern University, where uh, as one of our flagship institutions around the country, such things should be followed vigorously. Uh, 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 and so she wrote a letter of concern for which she was then roundly attacked right at her university. But at this point, it wasn't just an issue now of universities policing themselves. What was brought to bear was Title IX, which is a federal government statute and so uh, uh, what some individuals within Northwestern are doing is to say, we're not going to regulate ourselves on this, have our own discussions. We're going to bring the federal government to bear on this particular professor 
who is making a legal point about due process, and we don't want that to be going on. And that is a seismic change again, right, or an indicator. Please, one more. Yeah, I've got two more I want to put up here, just as journalistic snapshots here. This is Professor, uh, former Professor Rick Mehta, who was just fired recently from Acadia University. Apparently, he's uh, quite a dynamic, but also quite a confrontational person. I don't know him personally, but we do know people who are very active and arguey and so forth. And he puts, has uh, put on uh, uh, free speech panels and free speech talks at his universities. But uh, he has apparently made a lot of enemies among the faculty, uh, a lot of enemies among certain organized student groups. And on the basis of their protests, even though he is a tenured faculty, he was ousted. Now, this is in development. Uh, not all of the things are out. Usually what happens is as soon as a case like this arises, everybody clamps down, the lawyer, everybody lawyers up, and so we're going to have to wait. But uh, this is going to be a test case in Canada that will have certainly implications for the status of tenure, which as we know is a modern institution designed to protect academic freedom and free speech. Right? And then one more, uh, one of the things then on the other side, this is another current event that is being played out as we speak here. Professor Avital Ronell at New York University. She is a postmodernist, a, a disciple of Derrida, and uh, chair of a department, and uh, just chose her as a representative of another kind of dynamic at the other end of the postmodern spectrum. Uh, by all accounts, uh, people who know her, former students, current graduate students, colleagues, uh, even though she is postmodernist and committed to officially diversity and inclusiveness and all of the buzzwords, she has run her department in a strongly dictatorial, worst political correctness form you could possibly imagine for years. Right? And that was fine right, within her institution. And the only reason why she is now under a cloud was, again, a sexual harassment issue that has brought all sorts of other things to issue. So the point is, we are living in times when liberal arts, free speech, is at the very least under significant challenge institutionally. And behind that is a lot of intellectual work that has been done. What about the effects of postmodernism outside the university? Hicks suggests that because professors influence their students, as postmodernism has captured segments of the university, a higher percentage of the college-educated population has come to view politics as a naked power struggle in which words are just tools to advance groups' fundamentally conflicting agendas. Politicians lying, that's old news. I hope nobody's uh, feelings are hurt by my, my saying that about politicians as a class. Right? <laughs> Standards for honesty are not very good. And I also uh, don't think that the fact that people are, uh, that Donald Trump, for example, lies a lot. Now, I'm just going to take that for granted because I'm actually a, an apolitical person when it comes to contemporary politics. My Trump filter is very high, right? Uh, and so I'm vaguely aware that he says a lot of outrageous. Now, I, I know a little bit more than that. Right? But, but the fact that people are outraged that Trump is telling a lie, that's a non-postmodern reaction. Because if you say, Trump is lying and that's bad, that means the truth matters. And so that then is still a realist, objectivist point. You want to hold Trump's two feet to the fire for any lie that he commits. So it's only then, in my judgment, going to be postmodern if you have theorists and practitioners who, as a matter of their political strategy, say, we don't think the truth matters. And uh, we, we are fine with that. We're, we just have an agenda. We don't know if we are right or wrong. We just want power to advance our personal agendas. And the only way you're going to know if they really are thinking about their political quest that way is by first person uh, uh, autobiographical knowledge or asking them directly and getting them to know, very, know them very well. But what does seem to be, all of that said, uh, a clear influence of postmodernism, though, is an increase, I think, in the number of people who seem to be saying, well, we really shouldn't be worrying about politics uh, as being about truth and integrity and justice anyway. It really is just all about power 
and we're just willing to play that game. And that does seem to be a demographic shift. Here, Hicks clarifies that he is not citing postmodernism as the lone cause of rising public cynicism about politics. No, I would not say that uh, postmodernism is the only issue. No, no, absolutely. And then we would then do good political science, and then we would say when people are forming their political beliefs and their political commitments, uh, we would have to do a lot of empirical research, we say, about how they form those and where those come from. And some of them might be matters of religious demographics, some of them might be philosophical demographics, some of it might be coming out of social media or what's going on in Hollywood. Uh, so there are any number of possible sources here. So I don't think we would be able to do good demographics. But postmodernism is part of the mix. Uh, and I think the best data would be if you then study as a subset people who are university educated and you are able then to compare the data from people graduating, say, now with people graduating in 1970. If there's a clear shift and we know that a lot of those people are taking humanities courses, uh, then we will be able to make a causal connection at that point. But that's yeah, stepping way outside of philosophy and, and seriously into political demographics. Yeah. Staying on the theme of postmodernism's effects outside the university, here Hicks provides his thoughts on postmodernism and art. The question then is about postmodern art, and uh, uh, as you were, what's your name, by the way? Dorian. Dorian. Right? Dorian is saying that postmodernism seems to have wrecked art, and all of the positive value that one might find in art has been kind of systematically eliminated. So the question then is, if, uh, uh, if that's the case, what do we actually do about it? Now here I would say there's a, there's a couple of things. One of the, the big things is an institutional issue that the postmodernists do seem to have captured the leading institutions and there's enormous cultural prestige attached to art institutions and so it is relatively easy for them to keep the the money flowing and as long as they keep playing the game the money will flow in so a certain amount of it is careerist and i do think a lot of it is careerist even among the postmoderns because when i started reading and writing on this uh, I remember I wrote my first article on this in the, in the 1990s and just reading a lot of the postmodern theorists and you, you see them saying that you know, this is the same old crap we saw 10 years ago, the same old crap we saw 20 years ago with slight variations and so on, uh, but they're not offering any, any sort of an alternative. So uh, part of the battle then is going to be institutional, but I think an institutional battle is partly driven then by the donors. There are people who write multi-million dollar checks and they write multi-million dollar checks, I don't think because they're true believers in postmodern art. They just think they're doing good, asserting high culture and or they want to get invited to the right parties and there's a social cachet to writing the big checks and then you can hang out with cool people. I really do think it's as shallow as that for a lot of people. So I, uh, I think one thing that could happen is uh, an art market crash that they find a lot of the, mark, the, the, the goods that they're buying don't have good resale value, the word gets out and so art is not seen as a hedge. Or we just have uh, more people who have a lot of money say, you know, I'm kind of tired of this, I'm ready to spend money on something that's actually going to be significant. Now, that I think is a, uh, um, a less significant uh, 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 explanation for the problem. Uh, I do think the, the more serious problem is, is intellectual. We have to have an intellectually compelling, positive understanding of what art does for human psychology. Uh, and that there are such things as genuine values that we need to have fulfilled and in some ways only art can fulfill some of those values and here's how art works to accomplish those things and all of that means better psychology and psychology is still in its infancy, better epistemology, uh, better ethics about what genuine human values are. So until we have a significant number of intellectuals uh, uh, and future art critics and art historians and practicing artists is exposed to a positive, healthy philosophy, they're going to go where their teachers tell them, and that's going to be in, uh, in postmodernism. Now that said, I do think there are some other institutional things that are working. There has been a huge uh, resurgence outside of the formal academy in representational art, realistic art, 
Uh, not all of it is about beauty, but getting away from, uh, you know, just you know, here's here's my feces and uh, and uh, the you know the bus I took to Albany last week or the bus ticket and uh, uh, and that's my indictment of Donald Trump, right? So, yeah, you know. It's trivial stuff like that. So there are, but uh, there's, there's lots of angry art, but it's realistic and it, it's and it's portraying an important theme. Uh, and there are any number of ateliers now uh, of people who have you know, rediscovered or kept the traditions alive, and, and lots of different sub schools and conferences that are starting to occur, and uh, and bigger money starting to be put in it. So there is a parallel in set of institutions devoted to what I think is at least a an intellectually and aesthetically healthy art movement. Um, uh, so that's a lot better than where things were 20 years ago. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, mention some names here. There is a, uh, I think this might be culturally significant, and it kind of ties into a point that you were making. Like uh, four years ago, there was the first academic conference, to my knowledge, in almost a century devoted to representational art. Uh, representational art got blown out uh, by early modernism. Um, and since then, it's just not been allowed, if you are a serious art critic, a serious art historian, to engage in representationalism. But the grass movements has gotten to the point that there is a school now of academics who are taking it seriously as a real phenomenon, and they're doing what academics do starting to give papers and organize themselves in, uh, in conference. So that organization is called the Representational Art Conference, or TRAC for short, and I believe they've had four or five conferences now, some in California, Netherlands, and, uh, and so on. So I do see that as, a, as, a, as an inroads uh, that's going on there. So. Hicks had several exchanges with students about the effects of postmodernism. Here, one student expresses concern that postmodernism influences the way a lot of people think that people are taking postmodernist claims to heart, and that critics of postmodernism are not responding very effectively. Postmodernism sort of has this stranglehold on political institutions, not just political, but more cultural institutions, if I may. So like um, Hollywood and like all the more um, contemporary um, ideas. And I spent the summer sort of understanding it in Africa and sort of how it is sort of playing out in that sense, culturally. It's like, um, there's like, well, lot of like virtue signaling and sort of like this sort of trying to accommodate this new mm. wave of thought mm. and it's like this entire thing is is happening as a much larger scale as much faster scale than modernism is offering is offering a defense it's as of right now the rate at which is growing yeah and the rate at which people are more taking it to heart because yeah. i see a lot of people do take are taking it to heart right um i think that is perhaps in my from my view a much stronger cultural force than okay. the than the, 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 than the mm -hmm. um, fight than modernism yeah let me say uh, that you might be right whether these arguments are true and right or better supported is in sometimes that uh, that varies independently from whether those arguments are culturally successful or not because there are other factors at at work there so my sense is that we still live in a broadly modernist culture. This was a response to you. And postmodernism is vigorous, but it is a loud and to some extent entrenched minority position in a lot of the institutions. Now we have to drill down and say, well, you know, if I just speak from my, my home, philosophy departments, I think, are by and large a lot healthier. Right? Sociology departments, as far as I can tell, not very healthy. Uh, anthropology departments, not very healthy. History, mixed. Now, that though is not a philosophical judgment. That is a demographic issue, and we would have to then be doing, so to speak, sociology of the academic world, and that would require some sophisticated data gathering uh, and, and statistical analysis to try to say where exactly uh, we are in terms of, 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 of a result. There is a lot of politically correct movement, and it's um and it's, it's very loud, yes. but I wonder if, if part of the counter to that would be the argument that that's exactly why Trump got voted into office. Mm. It's because people are absolutely sick of it. Yes. And, and, and instead of um, 
realizing that they just bear down even more. And, and I guess right. we'll see what happens with the coming elections. But I wonder if somebody could make the argument. Right. Yeah. So no, I think that's exactly right. So there's the issue of you know, what is postmodernism? What are its positions? What are its general strategies? And then the question would be an institutional demographics question. And that, I think, is harder. So then we say, here, the postmodernists, say, took over, and they've instituted this very vigorous speech code, and they've taken over the campus in some respects. So then we might say, let's take Evergreen College as, a, as an example. Now, when we do the study, though, I don't know if we're going to find out that what happened was that there were, say, just five people who were very organized in key positions and very vocal. And they succeeded in cowing uh, into submission the other important people, and on the basis of that, in effect, mounted a coup, even though originally Evergreen uh, uh, College, 90% of the people were not radically postmodernist. I don't know if that's the right story, or whether it was 30% or, or, or 40%. Now, your second comment, I do think that that's right. I do think part of the success of Trump was a, a backlash against certain kinds of excesses. And I do know uh, uh, only anecdotally, but I've seen some studies where people have actually done the demographics here. And the, what a lot of people like about Trump is that, uh, you know, yes, he does lie a lot, but also he just tells it straight a lot. And so a lot of things that people had for a long time said, oh, we're not allowed to talk about that, or we have to you know, bend over backwards and give the benefit of the doubt to certain groups. It's just refreshing to have someone say, I don't give a crap. I'm just going to call it as I see it. Uh, and that's refreshing, particularly when we know politicians tend to tell us what they think we want to hear instead of what the politician actually thinks. So how much weight to put on that? Is that 40% of his electoral victory or 20% of the factory? I don't know. And it, it's hard to know because you can't really have an honest discussion with people. Part of the outrage is to call people racist, homophobic. Right, that's right. The rest of all that, and yeah. people are just afraid and they're only going to voice it in their vote. Yep. Here, a student suggests that Hicks or others influenced by Hicks may be exaggerating the influence of postmodernism and using the term to refer to everything that they don't like politically. When I asked you earlier, I talked about how, like, sort of the political applications of this, and it seems like we've been applying postmodernism to a lot of stuff. Black Panther, Campus Left, Evergreen. It seems like a lot of places, and I mean, on a, it seems like on a certain faction of, I guess, the not left is the best name for them, postmodernism has come to be like the universal bogeyman, mm -hmm. and I think a fair amount of this comes from your work, though I don't know if all of it, and it just... Uh, fair okay, amount. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah, yeah, well, I don't know. I, so, look, Obscure I guess, philosophy <laughs> professor. <laughs> impactful. Well, but my question is just like, I don't know, I find it... When you look historically, the sort of description of large factions of the left as part of a strain of philosophical thinking that is hostile to Western values and enlightenment, but there's a very dangerous legacy of that. So are you completely comfortable with the way, and I don't know how much you've seen this, I've been on dark parts of the internet for research purposes, but <laughs> how, are you okay with the way some of your work has been used to sort of describe everything people don't like politically? Uh, I have to say I don't know, because I don't know a lot of those descriptions. Or but but even like speakers we've had here. Like, 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 yeah, like we had. He, he's trying to, I guess the case we're trying to make is Peterson. No, there were, were others too, but Peterson's yes. perhaps one of the more egregious, I think. Right. When I hear someone describe like huge political, political factions they don't like as belonging to a philosophical project that seeks to undermine Western or Enlightenment values and to attack freedom in the name of advancing Marxism or communism, this sort of reminds me of some bad historical trends. Mm, okay. All right, let me say that I, I think the, the story I told tonight did leave off in around, say, 1970. Okay. So what, though, I think happens, and this maybe ties partly into your question about cycles of what, what comes, comes next, is that it is true that the history of philosophy and intellectual life more generally does go through more platonic phases, more Aristotelian phases, more skeptical phases. And postmodernism is following in that pattern in the sense of being one of the more skeptical phases and manifesting in that. But I, uh, I think there is a difference between saying that uh, a lot of the things that are going on right now are postmodern, and that a lot of the things that are going on right now are bastard children 
of postmodernism that the postmoderns are responsible for. So one example of that would be, I think it is built into the human psyche that we do need to believe in something. Uh, you do need to have some sort of framework in your life. And if you imbibe seriously a very skeptical philosophy that only gives negative answers to everything, uh, that philosophy is responsible for putting you into that negative state. Of course, you take responsibility because you follow that path yourself, but you're reaching the skeptical state doesn't mean you're going to stay in that state. And so what I think will happen is in many cases in the psychology of many people, they will be in a vacuum, an intellectual vacuum, a moral vacuum, feel that life is all meaningless. Postmodernism brought them there, but what they will do then is to say, well, to hell with it, I'm going to make a commitment to something. And they will then make a wholehearted, faithful <coughs> commitment to something or other. Now, at that point, they're not postmodern anymore. They might be making a, a commitment to Orthodox Christianity. And there are some people in Orthodox Christianity who will say, no, my route is through postmodernism. But I just found the nihilism you know, just unsatisfying, and so I just made this this leap of faith commitment to something that seemed to have some genuine values. If you ask them, do you think that it's really true? They'll say, well, no, it's got a lot going for it, but it's just that it seems to be working for me. Uh, and so I'm sort of realistic, I'm sort of pragmatic, I'm sort of postmodern. Now, that I think is a child of postmodern, but I don't think it's right to say that that's postmodern. So like, if, if somebody committed themselves to doesn't matter what, like a, a political agenda, no matter what its content, and they yes. really believed in that sincerely, you would say they weren't postmodern. Uh, respect of the word uh, uh, No, I don't think so. I can think you could get yourself to a non-rational commitment to a political agenda without going through postmodernism. Okay, yeah. But, but, you, could, but, you could be yeah. raised in this party, um, and when you're a young teenager, because everybody in your social circle is in this party, and so it's really exciting and powerful to you, then you go to college and you get challenged, but then you say, I'm just going to stick with this anyways because I don't want to change my mind. Well, that's just a combination of letting social conditioning happen to you and laziness, but you are, and that's not postmodern. No, no, I, I'm saying, if you're saying postmodern on some level involves believing in nothing, if you commit yourself sincerely to a political vision, irrespective of its content, yes. and you really do believe this, you're not like living. That's right. Okay, no, yeah. Yeah. If psychologically you believe that this really is true, okay. right, then you you've entered into a new. Okay, you, yeah, that's okay, right. Okay, yeah. Because then you're using the language of truth, and you're saying things like you know. Okay. Now, whether you are being fully intellectually honest with yourself, or whether you're just willing yourself into it, that's hard to tell. That. So, um, no, I do think, if we go back to the Fight Club analogy, uh, once everything has been torched, uh, it's possible for lots of people to spring up and go in different directions who don't themselves believe in torching everything. But you prepare the ground for them to spring up, and you, you need a different Script yeah, but so are you saying that like what? Uh, oh, there's this yeah. kind of Like, aren't like it seems like the the distinction to say I believe in something, but I'm willing to sacrifice everything else in the furtherance of that end. Like, if you say I believe in ending racism or whatever, but the rest of my values are up for grabs because that's most important. Doesn't that predate postmodernism? Like, isn't that just sort of a level of political ruthlessness that has always yeah, been around? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there is uh, the old fashioned sophistry. Yeah. That's a long tradition. Or um, uh, just power politics, Machiavellian, is in a far too much And then that does pretty big. But isn't that like so. when. I just think there's a tendency in the polarized times we live in to pick up whatever label possible to bash the opposition. And I think. They're smart, like I think a lot of leftist theory on racism is smart, but has been mispurposed for political reasons. And I think, I don't know, because like, I'm a very political as my questions might reflect, but listening to you tonight, you don't sound political, mm -hmm. but yet the way I've engaged with what you've said in the past has been all politicized. And I guess that's just sort of a sign of the times that it's impossible to separate good ideas from their political extremes. So what that then means is there's a division of labor at work here, coming out of philosophy perspective, but there's a lot of 
the sociology and political science and other things that have to do with work with whatever I'm saying and I've got a good theory to flesh out all of these things. Absolutely. Now we turn to the fourth question. Psychologically, what drives contemporary postmodernists and those over whom they have influence? Most broadly, according to Hicks, the postmodernist coalition, if you will, consists of a combination of true believers, virtue signalers, and non-ideological opportunistic power seekers. Some postmodernist leaders and activists are true believers. These true believers can be crudely disaggregated into those who are attached to a cause associated with postmodernism, for example, the mistreatment of women, and those who are attached to a theory associated with postmodernism, for example, contemporary campus third-wave feminist theory. Hicks suggests that many postmodernists start out attached to a cause, but ultimately become more attached to a theory that relates to that cause. And according to Hicks, those who take postmodernist theories seriously are focused on attaining power within their institutions to advance their genuinely held subjective values, not on doing intellectual work, not on engaging in good faith dialogue with ideological opponents. Other leaders and activists associated with postmodernist causes may be even more cynical. That is, they may not genuinely be epistemological skeptics or social constructionists or collectivist leftists, but they may recognize that postmodernist rhetorical strategies are effective for winning followers and supporters and gaining power. And what about those over whom postmodernist leaders and activists have influence? Postmodernist followers, if you will. Some, according to Hicks, are genuinely compassionate people who find postmodernist rhetoric about the oppression of victim groups credible and compelling. Others, sometimes called virtue signalers, go along in agreement with postmodernists because they want to appear morally sensitive or do not want to appear morally insensitive. You mentioned it particularly with regards to language and how language is particularly a tool of power in, that, in their case. And sort of like, well, they literally run... It's, it's the case of virtue sing I think that, that to me where it boils down to sort of, it's like the case of virtue signaling because no one wants to seem unvirtuous and everyone wants to seem as though they have virtue. So yeah. most people bend their backs over in order to be able to, yeah. um, and are basically complicit in this thing, especially with regards to like big tech companies. Like you see things yeah. happening in Google and Facebook and like across different major corporations, like even the UN. Yeah. So it's like, at what point, is it, at what point is it going to sort of, is it going to come to a head yeah. if, it, if it will? I want to add to that if I can. It's the same thing with the virtue signaling because somebody made the comment about Milo, Milo uh, Yiannopoulos much earlier and, and saying that he was, oh, I forgot the word that they used, um, but basically pushed out. Uh, what was, do you remember the word? No, I can't remember the um, But really. Shunned. Shunned, that was the word. Um, he was deplatformed. So, and what he's saying is that these corporations are actually like Facebook. They're deplatforming. That that Alex Jones and the Milo, they were they weren't shunned. They were deplatformed mm. unfairly. Mm. So they are they are really attempting to manipulate the whole conversation. Yeah. And at what point do people push back? So I think there's a genuine like this. Um, flow. When they do that to you, it's like having a piece of your humanity removed from you. Well, Whether you agree or disagree with the positions is irrelevant. Yeah. As yeah. a human being, you we, at least I think we believe in generally speaking that, you know, uh, speech and ideas and so forth are, are part of your humanity. So yeah. you're stripping people of that. Yeah, yeah I think that's right. I, I think the virtue signaling is always a uh, important but a secondary phenomenon because if you're virtue signaling there's always a, an insincere element mm -hmm. but what you're operating from is the perspective that you think some people have the moral high ground and you accept their terms for what counts as the moral high ground but you want to be part of the group so you signal whatever they tell you to signal so that they will accept you but then that pushes it back to well what is this alleged moral high ground and how did it become the more hard dry ground, and that's where you have to get to the, the serious thinkers and the serious activists. Now, I don't think uh, that the serious postmodernists, by the time they become postmodernists, believe that they have the moral high ground anymore. I think in many cases they do start off believing, say, suppose we take, we're, we're against poverty, we're against racism, we're against sexism when you're a young person. 
I think that can start off as genuine. You go off to university, you absorb a certain amount of theory, though, that radicalizes you on one view about poverty, racism, and sexism, and that makes you then, I think, increasingly jaded. But to the extent that you become increasingly jaded, you might have a personal affection for anti-racism, anti-sexism, and so forth, but it becomes more importantly that your allegiance is to the theory and to those initial causes. So one evidence of that is that I don't think you will find any postmodern theorists celebrating the fact that so many millions and billions of people have been lifted out of poverty in the last generation, even though they know that that is a fact. They will just ignore that fact because they know if they recognize that fact, then they have to say, maybe we were wrong and we have to give some moral props to our hated enemy. That then tells me they're more committed to the theory than to the evidence, but also their commitment to solving the problem of poverty, that's not the most important thing for them right now. And I think the same thing, uh, there's a variation of that in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in various forms of hyphenated feminism as we know, uh, uh, I, I can't keep track of all of them, so I just know that you, know, you have to have feminism of, of this sort, and it seems like the real action is being driven by the adjective that gets put in front of the, of the, uh, of the, of the feminism, that uh, when they were young women, appalled by various kinds of sexism, and, and you read about the history, and there's lots of bad stuff, I think a lot of that can be genuine, but then you go to university and you learn some, to my view, jaded and cynical, theories about sexism and, uh, and how it occurred. And the, those theories become more important to you than the actual battle against sexism. And you cannot, as a matter of theoretical principle, say, wow, women really have made great strides and isn't it awesome that that has happened. Uh, and I think another piece of evidence on that one is that uh, many of these hyphenated feminists are willing to turn a blind eye to uh, the abuse of girls all up and down parts of Africa and the Middle East. Uh, um, uh, uh, and then the, on, on, on the, the forced wearing of certain clothing and the second class citizen and you know, that finally Saudi Arabia is letting women drive. Right? Well, where have the hyphenated feminists been for so long? And they're not willing to do the kinds of things that you would think real feminists would do if they're genuinely interested. So I think their commitment to the theory is more important than that initial cause right now. And I think a lot of it uh, is that, uh, this ties in, I can't remember which person it was, I think it was someone who was sitting here, that it's in, in many respects not an intellectual movement anymore. Because what you have, postmodernism, when you take it seriously, it says really the intellect doesn't matter. It's really just all about activism. And so if you really believe that, well, you stop doing intellectual stuff and you just do, you just do activism. And it really is about power for you and it really is about your values. And you do have your, your hated groups. And however much you might say that you're against right, hate speech, right, the way you're crafting the policies is to give you license to do, express your hate on those groups, but to take the hate speech retaliation away from, from, from the other group. Um, uh, some of the ugly things that are coming out of Evergreen College, for example, this seemed to be of the students who were the ringleaders and they, uh, the first hand reports were that they just loved, you can see it on their faces, we, the, the being able to take their professors who were just kind of nice liberal women and just reduce them to tears. And that's a power play uh, when you, you know you've got tools and power and moral high ground that you can use as a weapon against this person to humiliate this person and to humiliate this professor in the eyes of the other students there as well so they know who the real boss is. And then, of course, they're intimidated. And so that's a power play. There is uh, coming out of uh, economic theory, um, uh, the, the formal name of it is called Public Choice. Uh, James Buchanan uh, is the most famous Nobel Prize winner associated with this. But uh, one of the sub-phenomena is that they call it the, the bootleggers and Baptists uh, uh, coalition. 
that the best way to understand how movements work, particularly in democratic politics where you have to build coalitions, is the theory of uh, strange bedfellows. And I have a half-written article that postmodern activism is a bootleggers and Baptists phenomenon. Now, the, the labeling comes if you go back to the era of prohibition. Uh, um, uh, the question is, are we going to make alcohol illegal? And uh, if you're a Baptist, well, what do you think about alcohol? Well, you think alcohol is evil, wicked, uh, it's, it's the demon rum. And on high moral principle, you want to have alcohol made illegal because you want to save people from, from themselves. But at the same time, who else wants alcohol to be illegal is organized crime. And they want organized crime to be illegal because they're willing to do illegal things. Right, to run the illegal stills and to smuggle things in from Canada. Uh, one of our family lores is, uh, since our family property is right on Lake Ontario, a very short boat run to upstate New York, is that my grandfather got a start when he was a young man, just loading up boats and running legal Canadian whiskey across to, uh, to New York State, <laughs> selling it. On a, on a moonlit shore and then and so that, I don't know if that's apocryphal or not, but <laughs> it is part of the family story. But uh, if you're Al Capone, for example, you have no problem with alcohol being made illegal. And in fact, uh, uh, that would be great because then if alcohol is made illegal, then the, the FBI and the police, they're gonna put all your competitors out of business and keep them out of business, awesome. So if you're a strategic gangster uh, and if you're a strategic Baptist, you recognize that even though the Baptists think the gangsters are evil and the gangsters think the Baptists are you know, prissy moralistic types, uh, they're going to work together. But those two together form a powerful coalition and they can get prohibition passed. Now, what you then have is the gangsters will finance it and they'll provide the muscle and many of the infrastructure, but the Baptists provide the moral high ground. And with those two put together, it's hard to, uh, to do so. So if we're interested then, and in, uh, uh, this is a, a, a thesis that is uh, still a hypothetical form but needs to be worked out, that if you are interested in power politics from a theoretical perspective. And most of the postmoderns will say, it's all about power. We're just Nietzschean power politicians. You know, Foucault at one point said, I really just see myself as a Nietzschean. And as we know, Nietzsche reduces everything to will to power. Uh, it's kind of a non-normative striving. So if you really just wanna be power and get, and so, well, how do you do that? Well, you form coalitions with groups that have moralistic grievances that have some traction and you use them. And so they're your, you know, oh, look at these poor victims of this, that, and the other thing. And uh, you know, everybody's defensive and everybody's willing to bend over backwards. Uh, but when people are defensive and bending over backwards, that's when you can make your move. Uh, but, uh, so you have the two groups, the bootleggers and the Baptists, and within you using Evergreen's example, kind of the bootleggers would be the true postmodernists who kind of take this cynical, uh, the, the, the cynical perspective. That's right, we want to run yeah. the campus. Mm -hmm. yeah. But most people are the Baptists who are just kind of, I don't want to say manipulated by them, but are, uh, using your language, bedfellows with them, just right. out of, just, I mean, they're liberals who have kind of a strong right. uh, perspective and, for and it care. Can be both, and, it can yeah. be both sorts. It can be those who have strong anti-racism, strong anti cism but they re believe that those are real phenomena and that they are objectively right, uh, but they agree, say, with the, 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 the postmodern, or it doesn't have to be the postmodern theory that says, you know, current society with its structures is deeply racist or deeply sexist. So they can be genuine, true believers of that, but they can also be working with the, another faction who are the virtue signalers who want to be part of the club, and we know how to play both of you uh, in order to advance our agenda. Um, and and I, I do think there's a type. There is a type of people who goes into politics. Some of us who are very normative in our thinker and don't recognize how many people are that, but they just like to be running things. 
And whatever system they are in, they're not particularly ideological. They will just learn how to play that system in order to get the power. And so if anti-racism, anti-sexism is the game, then we'll just play that game very well. I think with Evergreen, those students look like they, they didn't really have any higher uh, ground, uh, any higher moral ground that they were, they were operating under. They were yeah. just taking advantage. Yeah. They're completely thugs. Yeah. They recognized the whole. Yeah. And, and it was laughable, and they took full advantage. You can see in many of the Evergreen students that they did not have higher aspirations. They were just drunk on the power and being able to get away with doing certain things. And I think that's, that's right. Now again, this is stepping outside of professional expertise, but there is the, the psychological phenomenon of people and how they become bullies. Uh, you know, in the literature, if you are personally disempowered, and you grow up thinking of yourself as weak and as victimized, that does go against the grain of your normal human uh, healthiness of just wanting to be a, a real human being. Uh, but if that's bottled up for a long time, and you finally have you know, the, the beautiful people and the powerful people or the rich people, and you've got some tool of leverage over them now, and they've been making you feel bad, that uh, people, they do lose control and they go into full bully mode because it just feels so liberating finally to be able to, to, uh, to feel powerful. Yeah, no, I was just going to add to that. Children do that. You don't even have to wait until adulthood or, you know, uh, children do that. If, if parents are too liberal in their, in their parenting and they have no um, restraints, Children can get drunk on that power too, yeah. and and totally get spoiled and take control. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't have to get much further. Yeah. Well, it can go the other way as well. Uh, and now we're starting to sound Aristotelian about golden means and all of that. So that's too liberal, but also children who are raised in too authoritarian an atmosphere. Um, you, know, you see this more in the males when the males grow up, and they for the first time realize they can take their dad in a fight. Right? And some males who are in uh, some borderline abusive or outright abusive, right, it goes badly for the dad at that point. So yeah, the, the young male can't control himself, it seems. He's drunk on the power. I don't think that was the case with Evergreen. Though. Well, no. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be a different dynamic. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. And finally, during Hick's visit, we spent a fair amount of time discussing the origins of the Enlightenment. During his presentation, Hicks ran through some of the modern Western thinkers, institutions, and events that most contributed to the development of Enlightenment principles. So I want to go back to the earlier set of earthquake-like revolutions that occurred in the early modern period, focused on issues of free speech and censorship, which was, as now, one of the big battles within an overall intellectual battle. Uh, and so if we could, I don't know if you've heard of Giordano Bruno, he was a martyr, brilliant guy, kind of a wild and crazy guy, liked to argue about just about everything, had all sorts of heretical beliefs, traveled all over Europe, uh, seeking other smart people to have engagements with. He made the mistake of going back to Italy during a more conservative phase, was immediately arrested by the Inquisition, thrown into prison. His trial lasted seven years. He was found guilty and then burned at the stake for believing a wide variety of heresies right from the time. One of those heresies was the Copernican belief that the sun, not the earth, is at the center of the solar system. Now, he's a martyr, <clears throat> and other than historical interest, uh, we don't really take his views that seriously, but he was important to someone who was a younger contemporary. Please, next slide. And you've all heard of him, a towering figure not only in the sciences, and deservedly so, but also in philosophy of science and in philosophy uh, in particular. And Galileo, at this point, when Bruno was killed, was mid-career scientist, and uh, he took this very seriously. Uh, how, what should I t uh, think about this Copernican hypothesis? He'd done some studying himself, thought it made a certain amount of sense, but didn't want to rock too many boats at that point, and so turned his attention to other matters in physics and mathematics and philosophy of science. 
until about 15 years later after Kepler had published his monumental works and after Galileo himself had ground a microscope, or sorry, a telescope and looked up at the heavens, saw many of the imperfections of the moon, saw the, uh, uh, the moons of Jupiter, discovered them for himself, did his own empirical studies, did his own mathematical calculations, relied on the genius of empirical scientists like Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler, and came to realize there has to be something about this Copernican hypothesis. But more importantly, there's a philosophical issue here that we have to be able to talk about this, even if it seems like blasphemy, even if it seems like it undermines fundamental things that deeply religious people and institutional powerhouses like the church want us to believe. And so he pens this open letter in 1615, arguing not for the truth of the Copernican hypothesis, but arguing that the way we come to know things is not by reliance upon old texts, uncritically, even though they might have truths in them, but by using evidence, using observation, using reason, and all of the tools of that, including logic, mathematics, and so forth. A heartfelt plea for some space. Please stop torturing us, burning us at the stake. Let us sort this out as rational human beings by appeals to evidence, appeals to argument. Now, immediately the church responds in the next year, yes please, with a speech code. <laughs> Proposition to be forbidden that the sun is immovable at the center of the heaven et cetera, et cetera, and that the earth goes around with its double motor and spinning. That's forbidden, you can't say that. Galileo shuts up for a while, but over the course of the 20s, uh, 1620s now, he starts to write dialogues in which the argument goes back and forth, and he doesn't come out explicitly and say what he thinks is true. He's trying to model how the debate should go. That's too much. He's called down to Rome, shown the instruments of torture by the Inquisition, and told these will be used on you even though you are the most famous scientist in Europe at the time, unless you shut up. Galileo actually did not just shut up, you also have to publicly say that you don't advocate the Copernican theory. So he uh, decided not to go the Giordano Bruno route. He decided to publicly declaim any interest in Copernicanism. And then he was not allowed to publish for the rest of his life. So it didn't work out so good for him, but we do have an epistemological battle that is being joined. If we really are interested in truth, if we want to know reality, how do we get there? And it's not enough to appeal to revelations, to pre-scientific people thousands of years ago. And if we're going to go that route, we should be able to argue about the legitimacy of that route. Uh, appeals to faith, right, that you happen to have been born into a tradition, that's not going to be good enough. What are the chances that you happen to be born in the right religious tradition that's got all of the truths, what we need to do is be able to use our minds. Reason is competent if used well to figure out the important truths about reality. And in this context, it's put religiously, God gave us a mind, he wants us to use it. So in fact, the people who are being sacrilegious and blasphemous are the people who are uncritically accepting on faith whatever they happen to have been born into. God wants you to think and think hard because the truth matters. Now, at the same time, right, things are shifting north intellectually. Right? Galileo is being shut down and the silencing there. That sends signals. Right? And so bright minds start to go other places where they can pursue the truth as they see fit freely. And it's going to be northern Europe where the great scientists and the great philosophers and other intellectuals are increasingly going to be doing their work. Uh, an indication of this is the work of Francis Bacon, whom I'm in a very minority tradition here. I think he really should be seen as the founder of modern philosophy, right? not Descartes. Right? Well, lots of credit to Descartes, but that's a side issue here. Uh, precisely for his emphasis on empirical methods and uh, early development of more sophisticated scientific method. But what 
Bacon is arguing is, yes, reason is important, reason is competent, but it's not easy. And each of us, in the training of our own minds, uh, runs into various biases and things that are very tempting for in various sorts of intellectual shortcuts. And so if we are going to be serious, it's not just enough to say that reasoning is easy and so forth. It's very difficult, and the biggest battles that we're all going to face are actually with ourselves overcoming our desire for shortcuts, for letting other smarter people do our thinking for us, going along with the crowd, taking our immediate circumstances as uh, likely indicative of broader truth and so forth. So we have to get past the biases and train our minds to overcome what seem to be various shortcuts because again, reality is what it is, reason is important, but only if we train it properly and self-education and how to use your mind efficiently, absolutely fundamental. Now, a third part of the modern development then in this revolution comes a couple of generations later in John Locke is to say, if we're going to take what Galileo and Bacon have said seriously, that means we're going to have to be very tolerant of other people taking on this project of figuring out this very complicated thing we call reality. And the expectation is going to be that uh, since it's so complicated, lots of people are going to have very different takes on how to put all of the evidence together and what follows and what does not follow. And people are going to come up with hypotheses and beliefs that are deeply offensive to things that we think are true, important, and valuable. And so if this progress is going to work, not only do you require a certain amount of social tolerance so that you can do freely the thinking that you need in your life, but you also are going to have to extend that to lots and lots of other people who are going to challenge you and make uh, uh, and advocate value positions, political positions, and particularly in his context, religious positions that you think are deeply false and offensive. So toleration, in addition to working on your own mind, all governed by the commitment to its important to get the world right rationally according to the evidence. So jump ahead a little bit, John Stuart Mill, and Saeed stole a little bit of my thunder here, but that's okay. It's your show, so you can <laughs> go ahead and do so. Uh, the next slide actually as well, uh, got a couple of longer quotations here, the one that Saeed already read to us. But Mill, I think, adds an important component to this. As much as this is a commitment to reason and evidence that has started to take over in the modern world. And as important then as an educational project, working on our own minds and developing the intellectual virtues to be able to use our minds importantly. And then this ethical commitment to tolerating widespread opinions and so forth with respect to other people socially Mill goes a step further and says it's really not enough just to tolerate and put up with what other people do. That in a fundamental way, you should see other people disagreeing with you as helpful to you. Because it's very unlikely, particularly when we are younger, and for, even for me when we're older, that any one of us has all of it worked out in a completely perfect fashion. It's very difficult to do so. And chances are good that lots of other people who are well-meaning, even if they disagree with us on lots of things, that they have some elements of the truth in their position. And the only way you're going to find out is by engaging in argument, sometimes heated, vigorous, unpleasant argument with them, so they can point out the weaknesses in your position. And what you should be able to do at that point is say, thank you. Thank you for pointing out the error in my views. And for you to be able to say, ah, you have a formulation or something in your views, even if I don't think the overall package is correct, that I nonetheless, that's, that's a truth, that's an important element, and I'm going to then incorporate that into my view. So stronger than tolerance, tolerance is important, but actually seeing this debating argument criticizing process as mutually beneficial, something that you want to embrace because you really are in the truth. So this line at the back, I can't remember, did you quote this one here? Teachers and learners go to sleep at their posts. It's again, kind of a martial metaphor here. As soon as there's no enemy 
in the field. So we need other people to challenge us on a regular basis to keep us intellectually sharp and to push us be, to be better. Now, this is a very quick overview of what I think are four of the fundamental pillars of liberal education as it came to be developed in the modern world. That respect for evidence and reason is fundamental. That this requires that we each commit profoundly to a project of the development of intellectual virtue, no shortcuts. That socially we be willing to tolerate an astoundingly wide variety of views on all of the important issues, and that even better, we see the clash of opinion as a mutually beneficial set of uh, tools and, and, and devices that we are going to engage in. And that then became the foundation of modern liberal education as institutions like Lafayette College and my own university, Rockford, uh, it's not as old as Lafayette, it was only founded in 1847, so we're relatively uh, newcomers, but pretty old by Midwestern standards. But that was the kind of attitude that was fundamental to the modern liberal arts education project. Staying on the theme of Enlightenment origins, during the Q&A, Hicks speculated on why the Enlightenment largely occurred in Britain. If we then say that the Enlightenment first started in England, and we start citing figures like Bacon and Locke and, and others. Um, uh, what's, what's special about the English? Now, there are a couple of answers that I think we could, I'm not a, a scholar on this, but I do have some working hypotheses. One of them is a, an, an entrepreneurial hypothesis. That then is to say, if you look at the map of Europe and the map of the known world around 1500 or so, there's Columbus crossing the ocean for the first time. Uh, but Ignore the Americas for now. What you have is all of the powers are the continental powers, and the Italian city-states are still prominent. Hanseatic League and the Baltic states, they're small, but, small. but France is a power, Spain is a power, uh, uh, and, and maybe the German states and the, uh, are a power. But from the English perspective, uh, accurately, we're kind of this third-rate European power way out in the boondocks. We're, we're way out in the hinterland. And so when you have aspirations, but you don't seem to have access to the current roots of power, and you seem to be smaller in a lot of ways, you start to think more creatively. And when you start to think more creatively, then certain cats will be out of the bag. Now, this is parallel to an entrepreneurial hypothesis about you know, why was it the Portuguese and the Spanish were the first, as far as we know, to you know, sail across the Atlantic, establish, or establish consistent trade routes to try to get around Africa to the Far East and so forth. And again, if you look in the late 1300s, 1400s context, from their perspective, all of the powers are in the central part of the Mediterranean and further east and a little bit to the north. And again, they're way out in the boonies, in the boondocks. And there's no way that they're going to be able to get where they want to get to the Far East by playing the traditional game. So they have to start being entrepreneurial and considering different routes and, and that, that worked out for them. So what were then boondocks powers and relatively insignificant, uh, uh, I mean, of course, they could have just languished in obscurity as many <laughs> boondocks nations do languish in obscurity forever. So it's not going to be a thorough explanation, but maybe there is something to that. Um, there was a, a book, I, I, I'm not sure, of the guy's names. He was an English historian, but he, he, he uh, goes the route that you started to formulate in the second half of that. that maybe there's something unique about the English cultural inheritance in a, as opposed to as you go further east, you get into the, you know, the, the, the Danes and then the Germans and then the Prussians and, uh, and so on all the way over to the Russians, that maybe there was something unique to them. And I don't want to you know, say you know, the Magna Carta story and, and, and decentralization, but he, there's this guy, I think his name is um, Ian McFarland, and he wants to say something like it's the origins of English liberalism. And he does make a thesis like this, that when you look at uh, uh, English feudalism, it does have a feudal structure, but it does have a number of unique feudal provisions that you don't find in any other feudalisms in France and, and, and other European models. 
One of them is, and you mentioned the communalism. The, uh, the, uh, uh, for example, when a father dies, or sorry, when a father gets old, if he realizes he's not able to work the land anymore, and so leaves his land to the son, the son then owns that land free and clear and has no legal obligations to the father, not even to support the father. Whereas all other feudalisms have this more communal family thing that the father can pass the land off to the son, but has obligations to keep the father on the land and to, to maintain them. So there is then a kind of proto-individualism and a more clear set of property rights that the son now has in England. Also, uh, with respect to women, uh, one of the arguments that he made was that in English customary law, if the husband died, it was in English feudalism possible for, and much easier for uh, his wife, his widow now, to inherit his property free and clear. Uh, the English, for whatever reason, became more tolerant of, say, the woman running the business that her, because it was her livelihood depended upon it. Whereas in other feudalism, the, the rules were explicitly that uh, 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 if the husband dies, the property can't go to his wife. It has to go to the next born son, or it jumps over to his brother, or it has to stay in, in the male line. So what that then is going to suggest is that then you're going to have women who are a little more business savvy, uh, um, and, and, all, and and again, this is proto. But this book was very interesting. If we follow up in email, I can send you the link. And you know, he identifies a dozen ways in which English feudalism was distinctive going back to, I'm not sure of the dates, 1100s, 1200s. And so you can see seeds where other things coming to England can work with those and, and then you get a full English enlightenment. So again, fascinating stories to be told there. And continuing with the theme of Enlightenment origins, Hicks addressed at length the relative importance of the Greco-Roman and Judeo-Christian traditions in producing the Enlightenment. The big divide, though, uh, is between those who want to give uh, equal credit to the Judeo-Christian tradition and to the Greco-Roman tradition. And what we find, uh, I think, in people who are more culturally conservative and politically conservative is that, that they will say, yes, we have uh, uh, the Greco-Roman tradition that's absolutely important to us. You know, it's, it's not accidental that Plato and Aristotle and Seneca, uh, Seneca and Cicero are cited and that all of our political architecture is Greco-Roman and that we, we do our theater a certain way and we all know what the Hippocratic Oath is and we know who Euclid and Archimedes are. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, but they will also say equally important is the Judeo Christian tradition, that there are strongly positive contributions that come out of the Judeo-Christian tradition, and that what makes United, uh, 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 modern Western civilization uh, unique is that it is this hybrid of those two very deep traditions. And I don't agree with that position, but I don't think that's a stupid position. I think that can be a very sophisticated position with a lot of uh, uh, good arguments that can be, can be made for it. The other position uh, gives, uh, says that yes, uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition obviously has been important. The Greco-Roman tradition has been important, but if we're trying to explain the positive achievements of the Enlightenment, the Greco-Roman tradition is more important. And that's the view that I take. Uh, now the kind of evidence that I make here is that if you look at Europe, the Christians basically had Europe all to themselves for about a thousand years. And what did they do with it? Well, they start to then say, uh, and this is actually an article I'm working on writing right now, uh, is to say, well, you have to talk about scholasticism and the development of universities and this and that and the other invention and so on. I think all of that is true, but if you start putting dates to all of those things, that's 1300s, that's 1400s. Right? Uh, and all of that is after the Greek and Roman texts are rediscovered and being reintroduced into, into Europe. So uh, what I think is that that's a lot of now people who are strong fans of the Judeo-Christian tradition making their peace with the modern world but wanting to get some of the credit for it themselves. 
So my view is that, uh, it's not to say that uh, everything in Judaism and Christianity is wrong, but as a matter of historical development, that they have been uh, 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 more of an obstacle than an assist in, in the development. So what had to happen was a brilliant mind like Thomas Aquinas in the 1200s was exposed to the writings of Aristotle that had been recently rediscovered and his teacher, right, Albert, uh, Albert the Great. And with his intellectual integrity and his intellectual honesty is with saying, I think the Judeo-Christian tradition is absolutely right, but I also am very impressed with what the Greeks and Romans did and what this Aristotle guy has come up with, and so let's try for a synthesis. And that's a unique individual that comes along. But it is also important to note that Aquinas was almost excommunicated for trying to do that. And it took a lot of student activism right, uh, for uh, students who say, no, more Aristotle, more Aristotle in the curriculum. Imagine that. Right. Uh, for the authorities to relent. And so the cat was out of a bag. So I see uh, the Judeo-Christian as fighting I mean, a rear guard uh, and then coming to accommodations with uh, increasing inroads of humanism, full-blown renaissance, uh, and so forth. Uh, I do give the Reformation some credit, but I see it as unintended consequences. The early reformers, they were, you know, they hate Aristotle. Right? I mean, you read what Martin Luther has to say about Aristotle, it's like, my goodness, hate speech? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, uh, but he had a very rich vocabulary, right, shall, right, shall we say. And the same thing for, uh, for, for Calvin, for Zwingli, right, and all of the others. And what they're very much interested in is going back to a purified fundamentalist form of, uh, of, of Christianity. From their perspective, now in the 1500s, uh, the church has sold out to Aristotelianism. It started to become more worldly, and uh, that's a corruption of Christianity. We have to get back to, uh, to, uh, to true Christianity. But to their credit, right, what the Protestants did say is, we think the Catholic Church is corrupt in this theological way, that the important thing is for each individual to have a direct relationship with God and not to have to go through this institution, right? That God talks to God, who talks to the cardinals, and so on, uh, or, or, and or it's captured in scripture, but scripture is only available in Latin, and the vast majority of people can't read their own language, let alone Latin. So what the Protestants said, the important thing is for the individual to get a direct relationship with God, and the only way for an individual to do that is to know God's word, and that means we need to start teaching people to read and to get the Bible translated into all of the vernacular languages. Uh, now, their purpose was not to cause the enlightenment, but once you start teaching people to read and you start giving them books in their native language, then people start to read the Bible and they start to try to interpret it. And you and I in our Bible studies have different interpretations and so we start to have arguments about it. And I get better at argument, you get better at argument. And so we start to get more, more rational. And once people start to get rational and think that uh, evidence and uh, an argumentation uh, becomes important, that starts to fit into a certain kind of epistemology that's developing in the early modern world. So the cat's out of the bag, and the Protestants did, to some extent, let the cat out of the bag. Now, fortunately, uh, what we then have is the Protestants are making that contribution. The Catholics uh, did make their accommodations with Aristotelianism, and to this day, they say faith and reason are equally important. Revelation is important, but also Aristotle is very important. So both of them are indirectly contributing. So I do think uh, we can say positively that the Judeo-Christian tradition did add some things as well, but by a large margin, the most important traditions are coming from the Greeks and the Romans as they are reintroduced in, in uh, humanism and the Renaissance. One quick follow-up, um, Jordan Peterson and also the author of the book Inventing the Individual, whose name I can't remember, yeah. they both argue, I think, that Christianity and perhaps Judaism as well played an important role in spreading the idea that individuals are divine fragments, that they are made in the image of God, and yep. that notions of um, the sanctity of the individual, yes. which would lead to the political liberalism prong of yes. your chart, 
That's right. can be attributed to some extent. Okay, very good. And again, I don't think that is a stupid argument or a bad argument. I think that's an argument that can be very uh, well made. But uh, I don't find it very convincing because, again, for a thousand years, the sanctity of the individual right, rested very easily with serfdom, with slavery uh, in many parts of, of Europe, with the second class status of women. Um, and uh, if, if you think you take seriously what it says in the Bible, uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's anything in the Bible that says anything condemnatory of slavery at all. So one mark of the importance of a, a commitment to the sanctity of individuality uh, does seem to be a kind of repugnance against uh, um, um, uh, slavery and other forms of institutionalization. The other thing I would say is you can say the importance of individuality, but that also has to be interpreted the way a strong Judeo-Christian person would interpret it. That what makes you importantly an individual is your soul, it's not your body. Your body really is not that important in the strong versions of Christ. So what happens to your body? Doesn't matter, and that means all kinds of subjugation. Kind of, so as long as your soul is free. But then, even if we are interested in the importance and the sanctity of the soul, uh, that is complicit in the very long tradition of Christians, Jews are off the hook on this one as far as I know, Christians being willing to torture people for extended periods in order to try to convert them. And the argument is precisely the sanctity of the individual soul argument. If you really care about saving people's souls, that it's so important, what that means is that they have to get the right beliefs about Christianity. And so when you have people who have the wrong beliefs about Christianity and they are close to dying, if they die believing the wrong things, what's going to happen is they are going to burn. And out of Christian love, therefore, you should torture their body and be willing to torture their body because that's the only way apparently you can get them to listen. And maybe it's not that successful, but you might get people's attention enough and get a certain number of people on their deathbed under torture to, to, uh, to, to, to convert. And therefore you have saved their soul. So that individual sanctity, that is an important principle, but the Christian record on it and how it's interpreted, I think uh, is subject to lots of writers, both textual and historical. So I would, uh, I would de-emphasize that. Uh, now, that's not then to say that the Greek and the Roman uh, 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 record is any better. So I think there are some original additions that the humanists uh, are, are, are coming up with. Because as we know, the Greeks and Romans, they were fine with, with uh, the Greeks especially, with a certain measure of slavery, second class status of women. Uh, the Romans, I think, were a little bit better on, on both of those things, but uh, you know, the record is not perfect there. What I think you find is the, the germ of those ideas more seriously uh, taken in the, in, the, in the Greek and the Roman tradition, uh, uh, and then what the, the achievement of many of the Renaissance thinkers, uh, the Renaissance humanists, is to say, wow, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Greeks and the Romans had these ideas, and, and not to discount the, the Judeo-Christian importance of the individual soul either, but then they are taking that and elevating it into a much more universal principle. Uh, and then we get to the Enlightenment. You know, as late as the 1670s and 1680s, you know, it, it, it's really taking John Locke and others of that generation finally to write a uh, letter concerning toleration and for the first pol serious political acts of toleration to be put in place. The Dutch more informally had put uh, uh, toleration in place in the earlier part of the 1600s, less on philosophical reasons. It strikes me in the Dutch case, it was more uh, uh, pragmatic. You just get sick of all of the religious wars and let's just say, okay, fine, let's get, stop all the fighting and get down to business and, uh, and so forth. But that's late 1600s in, uh, in Christian Europe. Uh, just to follow up a little bit on Brandon's um, question about the individual, sanctity of the individual, the conversation that we were having was regarding um, my opinion on, on how the Greeks, for the first time in the history of humanity, represent in art the human being as beautiful. Mm. And, and that specifically is, is the individual as a divine being. 
the, the, the concept of the best of the best, or what we might call God, or the logos, or which the Greeks, I mean, which the Christians then pick up the concept of the logos that gets started with the Greeks, is, is this in, in infinitely complex uh, wonder that we're observing and is staring us in the face, that, that it could be represented in mankind in art. And it's, uh, it's that, that when the Christians have the, the, the seat of power and they, have, they destroy that. Mm. Yeah. And it's what's picked up again in the Renaissance and when the Christians are actually losing power, that they use realism as a point of propaganda mm. to try and... And it's that thing again that... that, that Sorry, uh, who's using realism the, as a point of propaganda? The Christians, ah. like at, the Catholic at Church. Is this now? Excuse me? At, at what time are we now? The Renaissance. Oh, okay, good. Right, so... That there, and it's, it's that... It's specifically um, that... Well, not... It, those are one of the elements that the Protestants turn away from in yep. North... And so then you have a difference in the Northern Renaissance and the Southern Renaissance. Yep. So this was our conversation about it. Yep. And... and um, so we do the history of intellectual life through art history, which is a, which is a beautiful way to do it. So the, uh, the first point, yes, is about uh, the significance of Greek art and the statuary that has come down to us. And it is important that uh, what you have in the portrayals of humans is uh, humans as godlike, but also the portrayals of the gods as human-like. So you don't have this radically other conception uh, or the idea that humans should cower and fall to their knees and press their face to the dirt in the presence of something that is immeasurably greater than they. We can stand straight. Oh, there's a Jordan Peterson reference, right? But I guess I gotta have my shoulders back. <laughs> um, we can aspire to godlike status and that the gods and goddesses are often portrayed as uh, just superior human beings, more like the way I'm talking with my students about this, more like the way when you're a 13-year-old, how you look up to your brother or your sister who's 16 or 17. And they are, wow, right, in their power, but you also have a sense that you, with some efforts and some growing, you could be there as well. And that is uh, quite unique in, uh, in art history. So that, yeah, that uh, valorization and uh, idealization of what is possible for human beings. And it is striking that uh, early Christianity uh, is, uh, in some of the more radical sects, uh, we have to be a little more nuanced here for sure, uh, clearly reacting to that and that they, uh, in a negative fashion because their view is that the human being is you know, uh, to use uh, St. Paul's words here, sold into slavery to sin. We are worthless, smutty, grubby. Uh, we understand what's good, and we, but we're not willing to do so. And so your proper attitude should be one of self-loathing. And so any sort of Greek and Roman idealization is just going to be a slap in the face and you're going to want to destroy it. Uh, and so there was widespread destruction. And then as you mentioned, that was picked up again in the 1500s when the Romans take over because by then the, uh, the Catholic Christians had made their compromises and they're starting to do beautiful cathedrals and decorate and paintings and so on. And then to allow all of that, one of the things the Protestants do is they go through and they, you know, they whitewash all of the frescoes and they destroy a lot of the statuary uh, in an effort to go back to, to, pure, to, to pure Christianity. And there is, uh, in addition to uh, just that humanistic point, uh, there is a, a kind of a metaphysical theological point that should also be emphasized here if we're going to talk about art, and that is a point about graven images, that it does seem to be a commandment that thou shalt not make graven images. And on the basis of that, whole fields of art then become metaphysically suspect. And the argument then is, if you are trying to take something that is ineffable, spiritual, supernatural, and capture it in physicalistic form, well, that's a, that's a sacrilege, that's a, that's a blasphemy, because you can't take something that is so wonderful and special and 
and, and, and defile it by representing it in, in physical form. And certainly it wouldn't then be, uh, then be, uh, then be human form. So I think that's uh, you know, in part why there are not graphic traditions uh, or, 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 or sculptural traditions and painting traditions in some, some of the sects of the, the, major, the major Western religions. You know, Judaism has a strong literary tradition, but not much of a painterly or sculpturally tradition because they take that commandment seriously. The Christians took it seriously for a thousand years. Uh, it was a huge debate in the 1100s about whether when we're building these great new Gothic cathedrals, uh, we should allow the, these emerging artists inspired by the Greeks and Romans to start putting Bible stories on the, on the walls. Uh, well, because then these are saints, these are demigods, uh, whatever status the, the various heroes have. Uh, but again, we have this thou shalt not make graven images and, and uh, uh, and that seemed a little bit sacrilegious. And the argument that seemed to prevail from my, my reading of the history of the time is to say, well, we, we do have all of these, uh, you know, to put it bluntly, illiterate people who are getting bored in the third hour of the priest droning on in Latin and they're just looking around. We might as well make good use of that time so maybe we can compromise and, and have some illustrations of Bible stories, give them something uplifting to look at while they're in church so then they can absorb some of the messages. But that was seen as a compromise on the, uh, on the theological point. And it's precisely that compromise on that theological point that the Protestants are going to react to and reject a few years later in trying to get back to a purified form. So yeah, really interesting questions. <laughs> <laughs>